בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ספיישל שיעור תנאי ברוך השם, uh, for, uh, רפואה שלמה for מיכאל בן שרה לאה, uh, שהוא אוהב רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף, also רפואה שלמה to לבנה בת שרה, uh, to uh, עובדיה בן לבנה, uh, דוריס בת ג'ורה, דוד בן עשריה, uh, דבורה בת מרצדס, אלישבע חיה בת שרה, דוד, בן רות, שרון בת רבקה, דוד בן אסתר, יוכבד בת בתיה הצדיקה, אין אור רבה מישראל בעזרת השם, אוהב רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף. Today I um, was uh, working on an uh, article, uh, we're going to try Be'ezrat Hashem, if you pray for me, maybe your merits will help me. Um, we're going to start uh, writing a uh, weekly, bi-weekly, Be'ezrat Hashem, hopefully weekly, articles, uh, different chidushim, different uh, short insights uh, from the Torah. mostly general, sometimes in regards to the parasha, most of the time we're going to try to just use different parts of the Torah, go over different parts of the Torah, both Rabbi uh, Ephraim uh, and I, as well as always, uh, we're always going to try to have at least one or two guest rabbis that we know, that are Talmidei Chachamim, join us and, uh, and write different articles. Each one uh, is going to be mostly Hebrew, with the exception of mine. We're also going to have Rabbanit uh, Tzara, uh, Rabbi Ephraim's wife, uh, she's also writing one, and Bezat Hashem, my Rabbanit Bezat Hashem will also write one, uh, but uh, each one will go through different perspectives of, of, of what they got that week, what they think we need a chizuk in, uh, and I was working on an article today, because when, for me, speaking is a lot easier than writing. Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave me Bucha uh, Hashem gave me the gift of gab. I like, I enjoy writing. Uh, and I've written quite a bit in my life, especially in the business world. I used to write long, extended papers and analysis and stories and so on. And I wrote a few articles in the Torah world, but each one, for me, is like uh, giving 20 lectures. Because writing is very different than uh, speaking. You don't uh, write the way you speak. You have to uh, make sure that the... Uh, Each word flows and it's comprehensible and the more you read, the more you realize how most books are never read, not because the content is not interesting, but because it takes a really long time to get to the point. You know, the, if you see most books today that are written, in reality, the whole story could be told in two pages. Most books. In reality, most of the points, and it doesn't matter what kind of book it is, most of the, the main points of the book, two, three, four, ten pages, max. So what's the other 400 pages? 400 pages to justify a $25 st- uh, price. But the real Chachamim, and what we try to aspire to be, will make sure to write each and every single word carefully to make sure that you get something out of every page, out of every uh, sentence, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more work going into it, especially if you value your own time, then that means you're going to value other people's time. So with that being said, I uh, wrote about Shema Yisrael. I started writing about Shema Yisrael. And... Uh, This has to do with our shiur. We're going to talk a little bit about Tisha B'Av, preparation for Tisha B'Av. Um, try to figure out what is it that we need to do. Is it uh, a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Is it just we fast for a day, do a diet, and that's it? We're finished? Or is it uh, something more? Arav Nishim, again, Allah Shalom used to say, that uh, every Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur, he would feel like he's going to a nursing home. When he goes to Beknesset, he felt like he was going to a nursing home. Why? There's a bunch of people in slippers asking, when's the food? When's the food? When's the food? 
And that's Tisha B'Av, unfortunately, in many places. And that's uh, Yom Kippur in many places. A bunch of people in slippers asking about, when's the fast over? When's the fast over? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, Am Yisrael complains, says, look, we just fasted. We fasted, no? How come our prayers are not being answered? We fasted. Yom Kippur, Tisha B'Av, 17 of Tammuz, we fast, no? Tanit Esther, how come you're not answering our prayers, Hashem? So the prophet, of, the prophet Isaiah comes by the word of Hashem and he says to them, this is a fast. You think Hashem cares if you eat and you don't eat? Instead of fasting and getting closer spiritually to Hashem, what do you do? You fast and spend the entire day saying Lashon Allah. So you go to Beknesset, and instead of talking to Hashem, what do you talk about? You talk about this guy. See, this guy didn't come. He's late. He's late to the prayer. Yeah, the guy never cares. Yeah, he's not really Hasidish. He's like a, he's like a half a chiloni with payers. No, him. No, no, he's uh, divorced. No, him. Oh, you see what kind of business he has? He's probably in business. He's working. He can't take off today. He's got a business. He's got a house. He's got a building. Everybody's talking about everybody else. It becomes, instead of a, of a bet knesset, a bet lashon ara. This is 3,000 years ago. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Same thing now. I remember when I lived in New York, it was a Knesset that I would go to, and every year was the same thing. Especially, you know, when I was secular and I knew nothing about nothing. I was one of the people, but it was always amazed me that the people would come once, twice a year to Knesset, just like me. But they made it such a big deal, at least I tried to hide. I knew I was supposed to go more often. Damn, they make such a big deal. The old Sadiqim. Old Sadiqim. But when they want to make sure that everybody knows that Sadiqim. Why? So they drive their uh, brand new car and they park it right in front of the shul. And they come out with a club outfit. And they talk and they're outside the whole time. So why'd you come to shul if you're outside the whole time? But when you don't know what you're doing, you don't know you're doing it wrong. So nothing's changed from the time of Prophet Isaiah until today. We go to a shul, we sit on the floor, pretend like we care about Beit HaMikdash, but in reality, all we care about is for the clock to be over so we can eat. Now, Hashem told us to fast several times during the year because these are special opportune times for us to connect to Him. These are special opportune times for us to reconsider where we stand. In reality, we're supposed to do it every day. In reality... If you read and understand the words that you pray every day, whether it's Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit, whichever one, if you actually understand what you say, every single one of the prayers should be the best Musar Shiur you've ever heard. If you understand and you actually think about what's being said, you should be able to do Tshuva every time you pray. Why don't we do Tshuva every time we pray? Because we're busy. We're busy doing other things. Rav Galinsky, Allah Shalom, used to use a pasuk from Teilim that says, The Goim, Ele Rebareche Ve'ele Basusim, Ve'anu B'Shem Hashem. There's a pasuk in Teilim that says, they are with the carriages, they are with the horses, but we are in the name of Hashem. In essence, what the pshat is supposed to mean, that they use all the goyim, they have to use all these carriages and horses to win wars. We win in the name of Hashem. Of Galinsky said, people to get to where they want to be, they use carriages, they use horses. Us, we just use the name of Hashem. As soon as Hashem's name is mentioned, our mind goes somewhere else. Tefillah, you say, okay, Shema Yisrael, we're already thinking about the work we have to go to, and the office we have to go to, and the meeting we have to go to. Immediately you say the name of Hashem, Shema Yisrael, we're thinking about something else. We have to go somewhere else. How come you know, you're in synagogue? Why don't you think about Hashem? Why don't you think about Hashem? Nothing's changed. So, if you look at Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael, anyone that's lucky enough to talk to Hashem every day, 
prays every day and knows that there's an halacha in our Torah, in the Shulchan Aruch. This is a biblical mitzvah that Hashem commanded us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, and it continues. Well, he says that you have to say Shema Yisrael. You have to say Shema Yisrael no less than twice a day. Once in the morning, once at night, and really you should say it before you go to sleep also. The reason why you say it in the morning and at night is at specific times. There are specific times during a day you're supposed to say it in the morning. And there's a specific times at night after sundown you have to say it. But the reason why you have to say it before you go to sleep is also because Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad is actually a verse in the Torah. So it's good to go to sleep with a verse of Torah right before you go to sleep. It's supposed to be the last thing you say. It helps destroy all of the demons that come from our sins and so on and so forth. We had a shiur about this some time ago. But Shema Yisrael also means something else. Shema Yisrael is a way that Hashem tells us, I want you to call out to me. I want you to scream out to me, figuratively speaking. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, Hashem our God, Hashem is one. Here, every single Jew that says this is recognizing the Borei Barach that he is our God, his God, meaning that Jew's particular God, he's recognizing his Malchut, his kinghood. He's recognizing the king as the king. And he's recognizing that he's the only one and there is no other. No other king from Abu Dazara, whether it be Yoshke or it be Buddha or it be Muhammad. And no other type of king like his boss or his wife or, his, or the husband or the competition or so on and so forth. God is the only God. Even his money or any hobby that he has, could be a false god. This is why when Yaakov Avinu saw his son Yosef after 22 years for the first time, the Torah says that Yosef hugged Yaakov and started crying, but Yaakov didn't hug Yosef. Why he didn't hug Yosef? The Torah says he didn't hug Yosef because he was so passionate about how much he loved Yosef, he was so excited to see Yosef for the first time in 22 years when he actually thought he was dead, that when he saw him, he was overwhelmed with passion, overwhelmed with love, overwhelmed with excitement. And then he realized, before he hugged him, no, no one in the world deserves that much of my heart. And he said at that moment, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. My heart only belongs to God. No one in the world, not even my son, deserves that much of my love. No one but God. Le'avdil, what about our money? How much time we spend talking about our money, thinking about our money, planning our money? How many people have planned their retirement? Almost every American has some type of retirement plan. Some have $500 million in their retirement plan. Some have $5 in their retirement plan with a dream. Either way, everyone plans for their retirement. I remember young kids coming to my office in the old days, 18, 19 years old, and they would ask me sometimes, oh, is there a retirement plan? I'm like, you're 18, you're not going to retire for maybe 40, 50 years. What do you care about retirement right now? Who says you're going to make it to this retirement? Everybody worries about retirement. They work so they can stop working. So just stop working now. Go to the street, stop working with the rest of the bums. You want to stop working. Everybody wants to plan for retirement. Everybody has a retirement plan. Because one day everybody expects to be retired so they can do nothing. Their dream is to work really hard so they can do nothing. What a dream that is. 
Imagine, you work your whole life really hard, overtime. Seven days, nine days a week you work. Overtime you work. You work not 20, you invented a new way to make more time in a day. Now you work 48 hours a day, not 24 hours. Why? So one day you don't have to work. Just stop working now then if you don't want to work so bad. But people plan for their retirement. They want to retire. They want to do nothing. So they go on vacation permanently until they run out of money. And they have to go back to work. But everybody plans for their retirement. People are so worried anytime they lose money. Like, oh, I lost my retirement. Well, how much did you lose? Oh, I lost $3,000. I'm like, you're going to retire in $3,000? That's one, one month mortgage, one month rent. What $3,000? What are you going to do with $3,000? You're going to have to work for if that's all your retirement. I had a friend who uh, her retirement was uh, these two medallions, taxi medallions in New York City. Yellow cabs in the early 1930s. There was a, uh, the, the city of New York made the taxi and limousine commission and said that in order for you to operate a taxi, and pick up people off the street, you have to have something called a medallion. And this medallion, it was going to be a li- was going to be controlled as far as the supply and how much the city was going to release. And every year they would release just a few more. But supply and demand says that if you have a limited quantity, there's going to be higher demand if it's a good product. In this particular case, the population of New York continued to increase, which meant that the value of these medallions continued to increase where in the 1980s for example 1980 the medallion was worth somewhere around fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars if you wanted to operate a yellow cab and uh, anyone that wants to go eat bechabod it's fine uh if you wanted to operate a yellow taxi you had to buy a medallion or you had to lease it you had to rent it from somebody in the beginning people just got their own but then the value increased rapidly all the way to the point that by the year 2013 one medallion was over a million dollars one medallion was over a million dollars i remember my father god bless him he says one of the biggest regrets that he had was that when we first moved to america in 1990 he was able to buy a medallion for a couple of hundred thousand dollars and he never did he had the money at the time and he never did so by 2013, when it went to a million dollars, he was like eating his heart out. Good news, Abba. It's back to 200,000. Why? What happened? What happened to everybody's retirement plan? What happened to everybody's retirement? Five years, it went to nothing. What happened? Everybody, that, everybody and their mother bought a medallion over the last 10 years. Even though it was 300,000, 400,000, it could continue going higher. Why did it continue going higher? Because everybody said, listen, there's only 13,000 of them. So we could buy this medallion, then we could lease it out to somebody. Somebody's going to pay me $1,000 a week. My mortgage is only $2,000 a month. I make $2,000 a month profit or even more. It became a big money maker. So everybody, including my friend that had two of them, this was their retirement. How could it go wrong? It's retirement. No. Well, they forgot that God runs the world. So in 2013, it reached a little over a million dollars. But at that moment, there was a tiny little company called Uber that said, we're going to go into the market. And we're going to go in a different, we're going to be more expensive. And uh, we're not going to pick you up off the street. You have to call us. You have to use an app. And it sounds kind of annoying to use it. And so on and so forth. And I don't even really paid attention to them. Well, a recent report came out. Uber is officially bigger than the yellow taxi cabs to such an extent that there are entire streets in New York full of yellow taxi cabs parked and no one's ever going to drive them. Why? Because all the guys that used to drive the the yellow taxi and lease these medallions are not leasing them anymore. Why? They're just using their own car to pick up people. And that way, that medallion that was worth over a million dollars dropped 80% in the last couple of years. 80% and it'll probably go to zero. It'll probably go to zero. There probably, there's no value to it ever again. There's no value for it. There's no point. First of all, the yellow taxis are disgusting. I'm telling you from experience. My mom's disgusting. Disgusting. Filthy. Disgusting. 
I used to be friend. You're in a cab a lot of times in New York. You befriend these people. I know how much money they make, how they do. I actually considered uh, buying one myself at some point. And uh, and I always ask him, how can always smells? He goes out. Oh, we never leave the taxi. So what does it mean? Never leave the taxi. They do their stuff in the taxi. No, that's disgusting. They use it as a bathroom. It's disgusting. So first of all, it's disgusting. If I didn't say it enough, it's disgusting. Now, after that, it's the fact that you get over the fact that it's disgusting. Oh, it's so disgusting. Uh, after that, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to, to use it. Why? Because you have to fight for it in the street. It's freezing. You don't know what's happening. You have to stand there like a moron in the corner. No, no, come. And finally, you think the guy comes, and the guy, you tell the guy, okay, I want to go down the street. Oh, no, no. No, go. Only to the airport. And the guy doesn't want to pick you up, and he leaves. Or better yet, the guy comes right next to you, and then he says he's off duty. <laughs> off duty. So he's, you just waited an hour and a half freezing in New York weather. And the guy, so it doesn't make any sense. Whereas with the Uber, you just press the app, he comes, he tells you when he's downstairs, you come downstairs, you're finished. Finished, perfect. Check out his refuse. So, listen, if he's in New York, he's most likely a criminal, but that's what he can do. It's a risk you have to take when you take a cab. Joking. Point is, um, the value of everyone's retirement that was in that business went down 80% in a business that everyone was absolutely certain that was their retirement. How many of us have planned for retirement? How many of us thought that retirement looks rosy because I just got a raise, because I just invented something, because I just sold a house, because I just got married, because of this and because of that. And then all of a sudden, Hashem shows us that He's the one running the show and our retirement plans get foiled and go into the garbage with all of our dreams and hopes and we go back to work all, you know, f- you know with, with a long face like a horse. Why? Because you realize we're not going to retire. We're never going to graduate to actually become these people that do nothing. Which, by the way, from experience, because I used to deal with a lot of rich people that retired, as soon as they retire, they usually die. Seriously. The people that are wealthy, that made their money actually working, not just being retired, uh, most of them die shortly after they retire. And that's because they're not used to not doing nothing. Working actually kept them alive. Retirement is not healthy for you. That's why in the Torah life, there's no such thing as retirement. Even on your deathbed, if you're able to read, you have to. Obligated to. Obligated to. It's not, it's not like you should, oh, it's nice, you're a tzaddik. No, no, you're obligated to. On your deathbed. You know you're going to die in 20 minutes. Can you read? Yeah, learn Torah. Why? Adam la'amal yulad. A person was created to work, not to retire. But let's get back to the point at hand. Most of us have or will try to retire, to plan for retirement. Question I have, how many of us that plan to retire in this world, how many of us plan for what happens after retirement, after this world? How many of us put something aside for ulama We plan so much, oh no, no, retirement, I I live here, but in retirement I'm going to live there. Okay, good, you have the house over there, fine. Yeah, but now I have the bank here, but when I retire, my bank is only over there. Okay, so the bank's over there, and the house is over there. And the car, this car, I have the car here, but the real car is in my garage, in the house over there, with the bank over there. Okay, the car and the house and the bank is over there. Fine, you made all these plans of retirement. What about Olam Abba? How many of us actually started planning for Olam Abba? Because Olam Abba can happen before retirement. My cousin is Olam Abba, arrived at 23 years old. He never got to retire. How many of us planned for it? When we learn, we're supposed to learn with that type of kavanah that this learning is for that retirement plan. That retirement plan in Olam Abba. Our prayer is trying to wake us up to realize this is what you're supposed to be doing. Planning for retirement in Olam Abba. Now, first and foremost, we have to scream to Hashem because we have a lot of problems. 
No one leaves this world without a lot of problems. No one leaves this world without a lot of suffering. If you're expecting a life without any suffering, it's the wrong life. Come back next stop. Everyone has suffering. There's no such thing as a life without suffering. It's called death. No one leaves this world without us. Everybody has suffering. Some people financial, some people relationships, some people this, some people that. Everybody has suffering. No one leaves this world without suffering. I'm sorry for all the young folks killing your hopes and dreams. Trust me when I tell you, you will suffer in your life. Make good use of it at least. At least I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth. Why? Because at least now that you know you're going to suffer, make good use of it. Don't say, oh, Bezat Hashem, you're not going to you suffer. You're going to live. You're going to suffer. At least make good use of it. Okay, what can I learn from this suffering session? One student, I teach him for three years, kaparat avonot, this one, that one, questions, night, day, this, that, personal family, their mother, father, problems of the family, all types of questions, all types of hours, 2 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, whatever. No question unanswered. Every question unanswered. Three years, everything possible, I did. He decided he didn't like the last answer after three years. The last answer after three years he doesn't like, so what he's going to do is he's going to spread the about me. Tell people don't come to his shoe. Why? I didn't like his last answer. Yeah, but what about the other 3,000 answers for three years? No, no, no. We don't think, we don't think about stuff like that. It's only it's what have you done for me lately. That's the mentality of this generation. What have you done for me lately? So, Rabotai, when we scream to Hashem, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. In reality, we are accepting Hashem Barach as the king of all kings. We're accepting Hashem Barach as our king that could bring us not only the national salvation, for our nation, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our children, but also bring us our own personal, individual salvation for all of the problems that we have. Why? He's the one that gave it to us. You ask, where's my problem come from? Hashem. Where did the Holocaust come from? Hashem. Where did the Parnassah come from? Hashem. Good and bad comes from Hashem. So now... When we're saying Shema Yisrael, we're in essence recognizing that He is the source of all good. He's the source of all what we think is bad, and so on and so forth. We are starting our day by recognizing the King. We are starting our day by saying, Hashem, you are in control. I am here today to work for you. Good? So far, so good. So that means, if we're going to start our day already, we should start on the right foot. And not lie to Hashem, right? It's not good. You're asking Him to help you. And then you're lying in His face, right? It's not good. Oh, Kvod can, can you give me the answer for what is this, this, and this? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. And then after you use that, use the answer to go talk against Him. It's not nice, right? It's not a nice thing to do, right? Look, Kavod, right? So Hashem, Avdil, Hashem, much more than uh, some guy that thinks he's a rabbi. Yeah, Hashem is Hashem, right? So now Hashem, Hashem, imagine Hashem. Imagine Hashem, Shabbat Hashem. Everything Hashem. You go to Hashem, Hashem, you are the only one that can solve my problem. I have a lot of problems. Like these problems. Problems. You could fix it. So you're not going to lie to him, right? Who's going to lie to him? Raise your hand. No one's going to lie to him. Okay, so now I have a question. After we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, we say, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloecha that's what you say. The verse goes, verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4 in Deuteronomy. Then 5, the next verse, continues. This is what we're reading. It's continuous. What does it say? And you love Hashem, your God. Same one you just said, Shema Yisrael to. Same one, not different one. Same one. Say to him, and you love this God. Love him. That's why we are. <laughs> if, if you tell me, if you, and you hate this God, is he going to answer your prayers? And you lie to this guy, he's going to answer your prayers? You're not going to answer your prayers. So you say, why are you going to answer my prayers, Hashem? Because I love you. What's my proof that I love you? I love Hashem with all my heart and all my soul and all of my resources. That's what we say every day, no less than two times a day. Now let me ask you a question between you and me. Which one of us actually means it? 
You just said in the morning, you woke up in the morning, Hashem give you neshama. You said, Hashem, help me. That's what you said, so many words. Why? Because I love you with all my heart, with all of my soul, and all my money. Now, how many of us really love Hashem with all of our heart, even when what He said is against our own opinion? When He says that we have to be modest, but we don't really feel like it. Because the neighbor is going to make fun of us because we have a hat on and she's wearing a wig to the floor. So she's going to make fun of us because we have a hat. Because we look like Sarai Menu and she looks like Korach's wife. She's going to make fun of us. Hashem said to wear a hat on Mitpachat. Hashem said to wear a hat on Sarai Menu. Wait, did she wear a wig? Sarai Menu didn't wear a wig. Rivka didn't wear a wig. So how many of us actually love Hashem so much that it even doesn't matter what we think or what the neighbor thinks? How many of us? How many of us actually care more about Hashem in our heart than the neighbor? All of our heart. Let's say half a heart. Half a heart is sometimes. Half a heart is when we're sick. When we're sick, we love Hashem a lot. When you're not sick, a whole heart, the whole of our heart. That's what we say. We start the day off. How many of us love Him with all of our heart when we know that in reality we have a non-kosher business? We're not allowed to operate it, so we have to close it. How many of us... Know that it's an opportune time to say Lashon Ara because it's so spicy and so delicious to say this Lashon Ara, but it's against the Shem. It's against the Shem. The Shem doesn't like Lashon Ara. I'll tell you in a moment how much he doesn't like Lashon Ara. How many of us? It's hard, right? Now all of a sudden the love is questionable. Okay, so let's go into step two. Step two said with all of our souls. What's all of our souls? How many of us really dedicate our entire life to do His will like, his, like He wants? Meaning, what, how do we know what Hashem wants? Does He talk to any of us? He send you any text messages? Jacob, He sent you a text message today? He sent you? To me, He didn't send. Anybody else get a text message other than Jacob? Nobody else got a text message. Only Jacob. Only, only Jacob is lucky enough to get a text message. The rest of us didn't get a text message. Why? Because He gave us a different instruction set. Why? It's called Torah. So how many of us dedicate, how many of us dedicate our souls, meaning our entire life, morning, day, and night, living based off of this instruction set, living off of this love letter from Hashem called the Torah? How many of us bam it? Not sometimes three times a week when there's a shield. The whole day, every day, all the time. Of course, you're allowed to work, you're allowed to eat, you're allowed to go to the bathroom, all the things you need to do, you have to do. But meaning, to do all of those things, no one's telling you you're not allowed to do them. What we're saying is, how many of us are doing them with the instructions of the Torah as the manual? What's what we're using that as the manual of how to do them. To work, I'm only going to work based on this instruction set. I can't work on Shabbat, can only work a kosher business, you know, so on and so forth in regards to modesty rules, so on and so forth in regards to negia, and so on and you know, all the things. A lot to work, a lot to eat, but you only have to eat kosher food, even if it's a business meeting. How many of us are living our life with this instruction set? Our whole life. Now we're getting a little difficult. Oh, it's an easy one. Third one. The kol meodecha. We love Hashem so much, we love Him with all of our money. How many of us made Torah our number one investment in our portfolio? How many people in the world have made Torah their number one investment, financial investment, not theoretical investment, not time investment, money, cash? How many of it made Torah their number one resource, their number one asset? House, most people, their number one asset is their house. Retirement current house, future house. Some people have more money in their parking lot than they have in their bank. Honestly, if you ever want to know why people go bankrupt, you just look at their parking lots. People spend three, four, five, six thousand dollars a month just on leasing cars. It's unbelievable. The level of stupidity in this generation and financial matters is mamash hitting new highs. People can barely pay their mortgage, but they have four thousand dollars in the parking lot. I see it all the time. Every Shabbat, we walk around a little bit with the kids, walk around. We see, you know, the houses. Everybody has the same house. It's all like little Legos. Everybody has the same house. But some of the houses, 
you have mamash four brand new cars and you know you just from knowledge you know this one is a thousand dollars a month this one's 1500 this one's 700 and you see people they have three four thousand dollars a month in cars like even if you have the money why are you wasting so much money on a car and four of it it's unbelievable to me people's they, they mamash they barely have money to eat they're living my much like if they don't get paid on time like they're stressed out but they're gonna spend seven hundred dollars a month on a, on, a, on a Lincoln or something or an infinity or whatever one of these stupid cars just get a regular car why do you have to spend so much money on a car and four of them nonetheless three of them why can't you borrow each other's car why do you have to have four no no it's my car it goes it's not your car anyway it goes back to the lot you're leasing it it's not your car anyway People don't know how to share. We get mad at the little kids. No, share, share. You don't know how to share yourself. Why are you getting mad at the four-year-old? You don't know how to share yourself. When was the last time you shared your car? No, it's my car. Oh, okay, so when you learn how to share your car as an adult, the four-year-old is going to learn how to share his bigale. We don't know how to share as adults. So, Rabotai, now we have a problem. Why? We said we love Hashem. That's why he's going to answer our prayers. Everybody always likes to talk about how much we love Hashem, love Hashem, love Hashem. Okay, let's see. You're starting your day with love Hashem. Okay, let's see. Which one do you love? Which way? You love Him with all of your heart, which means that you're going to follow everything He says, regardless of whether you like it or not, regardless of whether your neighbor likes it or not, regardless of whether you fit in or not. Already we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Okay. Second, soul. Your whole, Torah, your whole life is Torah. Your whole life, meaning morning, middle, day, the whole day is Torah. Used to, we have two problems. Okay, what about your money? We're not even going to ask that. Houston, we crashed. So, Rabotai, I'm not saying I'm doing it. I'm not saying anyone here is doing it. I'm just saying the next time we cry to Hashem, instead of crying to Hashem like, Holy, just say, let's just do a little reflection. Where can I get better? I'm not saying tomorrow we're all going to wake up and say, oh, tomorrow I'm doing all of it. Oh, it's going to take time. Pick one. Pick one. Okay, you know what? This one today I'm going to do good. This one, uh, the, uh, the, the heart, today I'm going to be all Hashem today. Today I'm going to be all Hashem. I'm going to talk about Hashem, think about Hashem. I don't care what she says. I don't care what he says. Whatever Hashem says, I'm going to do. Tomorrow. The other two, the money and the soul and stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But pick one, Ribbono Olam, pick one. Pick one tomorrow. If it's the money, it's the money. If it's uh, the heart, it's the heart. Pick something. Why? So at least it's not a complete lie. Because at the end of it all, you're asking for Hashem for help. You're asking for Hashem to give you a miracle so you can arrive home from work. And Hashem and Hashem, a lot of people don't make it home from work. So here we see that our prayers, if you actually delve into them, give us a lot of Musal. Now, after Tisha B'Av, there's a, in the Yeshiva world, in the Torah world, it's called Ben Azmanim, meaning that the Talmidei Yeshiva, the Kolels, they all take a three-week break. Take a three-week break You've been studying all year, morning, afternoon, night, non-stop. You need a break. No one says you need a break from Torah. You just need a break from that particular schedule. And a lot of people use this time to go away, see nature, relax, hang out with the family, and so on. Now, it's known that everyone that really cares about Torah takes some books with them. But you can't ca carry all your books. Not everyone likes to carry all their books. So usually you carry, you know, one Gemara, one Masechet you're going to learn, maybe uh, a, few, a few interesting things you have. But the one thing that is very easy to forget is Musar. It's very easy to forget the Musar book. It's always heavy, the Musar book. It's always heavy. So Hashem is doing us a favor. Every year at this time, we start Sefer Dvarim. And Sefer Dvarim is an entire Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy. The whole thing is Musar. The whole book of, of Dvarim is all Musar from Moshe Rabbeinu. 
the number one rabbi of all time. Every single verse is Musar. Every single verse is rebuke. As Rabbi Nachman Breslov said, when Moshe Rabbeinu went to Hashem, he said, Hashem, why are you so mad at them? Okay, so they worshipped an idol, but no, come on, they're just people. They're kids, they're like two little retarded kids, they don't know what they're doing, right, left, they were playing with the statue, next thing they worshipped it, they didn't really know. They were playing with it, they didn't really know it's, they didn't know Hashem, they didn't mean it. The kids, no, Hashem, you're infinity uh, age. They are just what, twenty years old, thirty years old. They don't know anything, Hashem. They don't know. Hashem says, "Okay, okay, go, go down to them." Then he goes down. Moshe Rabbeinu comes from Mount Sinai. He says to Am Israel, "You made a really big sin, Menuvalim. Look what you did, you despicable people. Am Naval velo Chacham, despicable people that are not smart. What do you mean? Just said to Hashem." He didn't do a big deal. They're, they're retarded kids. Kids, no, what happened to that? Because to him I said it. To you, I have to tell you the truth. You have to do tshuva. I had to convince him. If I told him the truth, if I told him what I really thought, then what do you think? He's going to kill you. But really, in reality, we made a big sin. From here, our sages teach us that when you go to Hashem, you pray for your students, you pray for your people, you pray for your parents, you pray for your kids, and so on and so forth, you pray in their favor. Even if they're not necessarily the biggest tzaddikim in the world, you pray for them. Maybe Be'ezot Hashem they'll do tshuva. But that does not mean that you make pretend like they're really tzaddikim. And tell them, no, no, you're a tzaddik. What tzaddik? The guy's a mechalet Shabbat. No, no, the guy is Sadiq, he donated money, yeah, to the Red Cross, so he could fund Christianity. What, what donated? No, he's got a big heart, yeah, big heart, thinking about girls all day. What big heart? What big heart? Was it teddy bear? You cannot lie to people just because you want to make them feel good. Now, the problem is that many of the leaders today are making the same mistake we've been making for the last... 2,000 years. And they think that just because you tell people the truth that's going to make them question themselves, it's not good way. So the Gemara teaches us who did this, who didn't do it. The Gemara in Baba Batra says that what was the significance of Job? Ma'ala of Job. Job, the Ramban, in the commentary, the beginning of uh, Job, says that anyone that reads the book of Job, if he's normal, has to do tshuva. Why? You see the amount of suffering that he went through just during the first two pages of the book. Not the whole book, just the first two pages. The amount of suffering that Job went through, anyone that's normal has to do tshuva. Just to know that it's even a remote possibility that it could happen to you. That alone should scare you worse than the gain Om Shiu. The book of Job is so scary and so much full of Musal of what can happen to a person in this world, forget Gainom, just in this world, that it's part of the small amount of Torah we are allowed to learn during Tisha B'Av. During Tisha B'Av, there are certain restrictions. You're not allowed to eat. You're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to bathe. You're not allowed to be with intimate, with your wife, with your husband. It's a few things you're not allowed to do. But one of the things you're also not allowed to do, aside also you're not allowed to rub oils, creams on yourself. That's the fifth thing. But one of the other things you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to be happy. Not allowed to be happy. Why? Because Tisha B'Av is the time when both Bet Mikdash were destroyed. Both of them. First one and second one. Tisha B'Av, all of the major disasters in the history of Am Yisrael happened on Tisha B'Av. Not just the Bet, uh, Bet Mikdash. Not just the first one. Not just the second one. If you look at all of the major disasters that ever happened to Am Yisrael in history, 
It happened on this day. If it's the Meraglim, the spies that said Lashon Ara about the land, the spies that said Lashon Ara about Hashem, they came back and they made the entire nation cry. Hashem says, you cried for no reason today, I will give you a reason to cry for eternity, forever in this world, on this day, for, for real reason. That was officially when Tisha B'Av was created, during the Meraglim. And for that, the generation was punished that not a single one of them, with the exception of Yeshua ben Nun and Kalev, not a single one of them will have the merit to enter Eretz Yisrael. All of them will die in the desert. Why? They cried for no reason. Tisha B'Av was also when were historically horrible dates, horrible times during the pogroms and inquisitions, the Spanish Inquisition, the pogroms, the Kristallnachen during the Nazi Germany times, all of the different things that happened throughout our history, the horrible things, the horrible events happened on Tisha B'Av. So anyone that delves and thinks about those things easily cannot be happy. Easily you can be sad. But there is something that can create a lot of happiness in a person even if all the sadness in the world surrounds him. And that is learning Torah. So Hashem says, you're not allowed to learn Torah on Tisha B'Av. Because learning Torah will give you the ultimate happiness. You're not allowed to learn Sefer Bereshit. You're not allowed to learn Sefer Shemot. You're not allowed to learn a lot of the Torah. What are you allowed to learn? You're allowed to learn things that are relevant to the destruction of Bet Mikdash. All Masechet Gitin, all the things that happened during the destruction, different Gemarot, the end of Masechet uh, uh, Brachot, has a few stories of what happened to the Tzadikim, how they, they killed Rabbi Akiva, peeled off his skin, Hashem Yerachem, all types of horrible things. That you're allowed to study. The book of Echa, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, what happened at the destruction of Bet HaMikdash, Anyone that reads it in a language they understand and not just makes the sounds, immediately becomes very, very sad. A lot of people make the sounds. A lot of people know how to make sounds. Echa. Okay, anybody know what Echa means? Echa means, how did they get to this? That's what it means. I thought my whole life, I thought Echa was a name. Oh, yeah, Prophet Echa. Prophet Echa. Echa means, how did they get to this? Oy vey. That's what it means. But we don't know, we just make sounds. You have to read these things in a language you understand. It doesn't make a difference what everyone else is doing. It makes a difference what you're doing. You learn it, you learn it in a language you understand. And if you learn what happened during the destruction of Bet HaMikdash, and you see that before the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, what level of starvation we got to to such an extent that the mothers had to eat their own children. Shem Yerachim. This is not the first or second time this happened in history. This happened many times throughout our history. This is the punishment that Hashem promised us. If we disobey Him, will happen in Parashat Bechukotai and Parashat Kitavo. Twice in the Torah, no less, does it say that Hashem will punish us to that extent that we'll get to such level of starvation that mothers will eat their children. And this happened multiple times throughout history. First Bet Mikdash, second Bet Mikdash, and even during Nazi Germany. This is, the part of the, this is part of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust that people don't like to talk about. I brought it in a shiul a year or two ago, showed people proof that this actually is what happened. The point being, Abu Tai, you learn these things, it's very easy to get said. Now, one of the things you're able to learn on Tisha B'Av is the book of Job. Why? Because the book of Job, anyone that actually understands the words, understands what happened to Job, immediately becomes sad. Why? Because he knows it's possible that it could happen to him. He knows it's possible that it could happen to her. Why? It happened to a human being. It happened in this world. It's all things we can understand. The guy wakes up in the morning, a multi-billionaire, 10 kids. By the afternoon, all 10 kids died. That happened to people in this world. 
by the afternoon all of his money is gone. That happened to people in this world. By the afternoon he became sick. That happened to people in this world. Today you go to the hospital healthy with a cold, you come back sick with some disease because they used the wrong needle. Two kids, young, from South America, Jewish guys, in the 1980s, went to hospital because they had hemophilia. Not a deadly disease, but not something comfortable either. The hospital said they had a cure. They were going to be part of a study. They went to the doctors. They went to the hospital. And mistakenly, one of the nurses that was doing a different study injected these two boys with a needle that had AIDS in it. Both guys got AIDS. Young, Jewish kids. Had a little problem, but not deadly. Now it became deadly, but it's a different disease. You wake up in the morning with a cold, you now have AIDS in the afternoon. One of the kids realized, we're going to die. I'm going to meet my maker soon. I'm going to do tshuva. His brother didn't decide the same thing. He said, I'm going to live life to the fullest. He wanted to go party. He wanted to enjoy life. This is recorded in a shiul from maybe 20 years ago by Rabbi Amnon Yitzchak. They showed, and they showed up on a shiul. Testified. One of them testified. The one that went partying, partied, 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 and then died from AIDS. The one that did tshuva, did real tshuva. Continued going to the doctor. One day he goes to the doctor and they ask him, okay, no, what's the trick? What trick? What's the, what'd you do? What'd you do with the blood? What'd you do? Come on, let's do a blood check again. He goes, did a blood check. It's not the nurse, everything. No, no, no. Babette, no, what'd you do? Nothing. What? What did I do? What are you talking about? He said, are you serious? I said, I'm serious. Why? What's serious? You don't have AIDS. The incurable disease disappeared. Until this day, 30 years later, it's an incurable disease. Yes, there's ways that you can live for 20 years like Magic Johnson and other people like him that have a zillion dollars, but the average person dies. Or at least lives a very, very miserable short life. It doesn't disappear unless you're a Jew that does tshuva. So Job woke up healthy in the afternoon he's sick. But sick to such an extent that the worms are leaving his body, not coming in. He became like rotten meat. Abscesses all over his body. I felt like I was dying with two or three at a time. He had it all over his body. Now the Gemara and Baba Batra ask, what was such a significance of Job? What was something special about Job? It says, Job was a tzaddik. Why? He tried to relieve all of Am Yisrael from their responsibility, all of mankind from their responsibility to their maker, to their creator. What? He said to Hashem, Ribbon Olam, you created the cow and you created a donkey. One has hooves that are split. One has hopes that are not split. Meaning, you decided why this one has hopes that split and this one has no... There's no actual real scientific reason of why or that makes sense of why one would have and one would not have. Bless you. There's no real reason. Like, this doesn't make sense. Okay, why can't we just eat a donkey? Looks delicious, no? Don't tell me it doesn't look delicious. Why? The cow looks delicious? The Arabs love it. That's what they sell to the Jews thinking it's cows. But anyway, they sell the meat. That's what they do. They sell the donkey meat to the Jews in Israel that are not really so much bidim. They sell it to them as if it's a cow meat. The point is, Rabotai, Job comes to Hashem and he tells him, Hashem it barach. Meaning you run nature. You decide it here makes sense, here it doesn't make sense, meaning it's your rules. You created. The Yetzirah, uh, you created the, e- the evil person. You created the good person.
you create kapat avonot also. You created a good person. You created an evil person. Meaning, some guys were just born with inclination to be tzaddikim. They just have a good nature. They were born or came into this world. Most they're humble already automatically. They're humble. They're good nature. They're giving. They're, they're, they're the good nature people. You created these tzaddikim. And some people are uh, born not exactly tzaddikim. Some people like to play with fire. Some people are pyromaniacs. Some people like to kill animals for no reason. Some people are a little crazy. So you created them too. Hashem, you created them. You created good, you created bad. So Hashem, who can beat you? Meaning what Job was trying to say, Hashem, you created all these things anyway. So for any of us to be able to do tshuva, we have to go against your creation. Because you created them bad. Because you created them with hooves. You created them with an evil inclination. You created them with this. Job was trying to get everybody to be Tinoch Shanishba. Everybody doesn't know. And that's why his friends came to him, the Gemara says, and rebuked him. He says, oh, Job, you're making a mistake. What's the mistake you're making? You're making a mistake that, yes, even though some people have an inclination to do something bad, Hashem also gave them at least just as much power to do something good. Even though he has an inclination to see blood. He doesn't have to use it to murder people. He can become a surgeon. He can become a butcher. He doesn't have to become a murderer. Even though you have an inclination to look at certain things, that's fine. Don't look at that. Look at something that's kosher. He gave you evil inclination. He gave you a good inclination. That was the mistake that Job made, and unfortunately, that mistake is being made today. Job did tshuva. That's why there's a book in the Torah written about him. Because he did tshuva, he chatanu, avinu, pashanu, I'm sorry, Hashem, I have questioned you, and he did complete tshuva, became Kodesh Kodeshim, and it's a book called the Book of Job written about him. What about the people of today? What about the people for the last couple of thousand years since Job? Not so much. So the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat gives us some things that we need to chew on. Because people have heard the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed for a few reasons. The first one was, was destroyed because of Avodah Zarah, Shfichut Damim. And who knows the third? You're looking at me, so I'm assuming you want to complete it. Avodah Zarah? Hiloi Arayot. Avodah Zarah? Idol worship. Shfichut Damim? Spilling blood. Hiloi Arayot is sex crimes. Now most people think that these are the only three sins, the entire nation, millions and millions of people only made three sins. Everything else, they were perfect. That's the mistake. The three sins are not only three sins. They're three general topics. They're three descriptions for the main category, but it's not all of the subcategories. Because every time in the 12 times that it's mentioned in the Torah that idolatry, that, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Chilul Shabbat is a death penalty, right next to it in those all 12 times you will see that idolatry is also death penalty. Chilul Shabbat is death penalty and Abu Zarah is death penalty. From here the sages teach us that Hashem considers Desecrating Shabbat, the same thing as idolatry. And Chazal teaches us in Masechet Shabbat that the reason why the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed was because of Chilul Shabbat. So then they ask, wait a minute. Where does the Gilu Arayot come from? Where does the uh, spilling blood come from? How are they all connected? And isn't it true that Am Yisrael saw so many miracles 
in the Bet HaMikdash that it would be crazy for them to worship an idol? Like you're seeing fire come from heaven every few minutes. But the fire is not like a fire like you're imagining. The fire, the Sfarim HaKadoshim described, the fire was the shape of a lion. The shape of a giant lion is coming from Shemaim to Bet HaMikdash. And you're going to go worship an idol? Does that make any sense? If you remember, I told you the Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin answers this question. How could Am Yisrael worship an idol? Didn't, know, didn't they all know it was all nonsense? The Gemara says, of course they knew it was nonsense. But they also knew that as soon as they were classified as idol worshippers, no one would even try to get, to do, get them to do tshuva. People would just give up on them. And if they gave up on them and they consider, ah, this guy's an idol worshiper, then they could go do whatever they really wanted to do, which was sex crimes. Then they could walk around immodest. Then they could walk around and go to the prostitutes. That's what they really wanted to do. They wanted to do gilu rayot. That was the real reason of why the idolatry started. But here the Gemara tells us how this map started. We'll go from the end to the beginning. Gemara Masechet Shabbat page 120a and 119b says Rava says Lo charva Yerushalayim Ela bishvil shepasku mimena anshe emana Yerushalayim was not destroyed only because I'm sorry, Yerushalayim was destroyed only because people of emet, of truth, had disappeared from it. So the Gemara continues and tries to delve into this sugya. What do you mean, men of truth? There's no men of truth. There's no men of truth. And one of the commentaries at the end, in the beginning of, uh, of 120a, says, no difficulty here. What do they mean by no men of truth? One of the meanings is that the prophet Jeremiah tells people, hey, go into the street, go into the market, go find me a man of truth. Meaning that even in their own world, we got to such a low level, such a low level of Kedusha, that even in the secular world, in a secular world, there was no man of truth. Meaning you go into the market, go find an honest businessman. Go find one person that's going to take the retainer from you and actually do the job. Go find one doctor that's going to actually diagnose you for your real problem and not just going to give you a bunch of pills just to try to kill you maybe. Go find one person that's honest. Forget it. Of course, Torah, mitzvot, they're not keeping. That's a given. He's saying even in their own world, they're not succeeding. They're saying, no, no, we don't need Torah. We're going to be good. Without Torah, we're fine. We're fine. We don't need Torah. I can figure it out on my own. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm everybody today. I'm a good person. Everybody says I'm a good person. Nobody says I'm a Nazi. Everybody says, even the Nazi says I'm a good person. Hey, I'm a good person. I'm a good at heart. I have a big heart. Okay, but then you see the guy's cheating in his business. You see the guy's overcharging people. You see the guy's stealing from his customers. You see the guy's stealing from the government. People are liars. Prophet Jeremiah says, before Beth Megdash, that's exactly what it was. People were liars. In even their own world. They didn't even meet their own definition of good. The prophet says this, the Chacham says, Rava says, oh, this, this was the last straw. When Hashem saw that they're not complying with Torah, that was already bad enough. But when he saw what happened as a result of it, they weren't even able to fulfill even the seven Noahide laws. They weren't even able to fulfill just human beings. They weren't even able to be decent human beings without Torah. Hashem says, there's no way for them. There's no way for the world to continue. Resh Lakish teaches a different, another subcategory from the three things. Another subcategory. Resh Lakish says, En ha'olam mitkayem Ela bishvil evel tinokot shel bet raban. 
It says the world only continues to exist only in the merit of the breath that comes out of the mouth of school children when they learn Torah. So Rav Papa and Abaye said to Abaye, he says to him, wait a minute, what about you and me? You were big Talmidei Chachamim. What about our Torah? Tanaim, Gamoraim, each one is able to revive the dead. What about us, school kids, little five, six, seven, eight year old, little Joshua right now learning Torah? The whole world exists because of him. Why? He's eight years old. Abaye is a Mechayim Etim. Why? Abaye says something scary. Abaye says, a breath that contains a taint of sin cannot be compared to breath that does not contain a taint of sin. Meaning, even though Torah, we made some sins, we make some sins, our Torah automatically is not the same level as the eight-year-old learning Kriyat Shema. The little eight-year-old learned Kriyat Shema is more significant than the Tana. Why? He hasn't made sins. So significant is the Torah of the little kids that Resh Lakish says, "En mevatlin tinokot shel bet Rabban afilu lebinyan bet Hamikdash." We're not allowed to divert the school kids from their Torah studies, even if it was for the sake of building the Bet Mikdash. Meaning, if they told us, oh, news, breaking news, breaking news, we have to go build the third Bet Mikdash. Mashiach is here. Abutai, Mashiach is here. Tisha B'Av is canceled. Everything is canceled. Okay, fine. The kid's learning. When he finishes school, after he finishes school, then we'll go build, help you with this Bet Mikdash of yours. Yeah, no, no. Mashiach is here. No, no, no. My kid, he's finished his school at 3 o'clock. It's only 12. It's only 12. He's learning. When he finishes school, I go pick him up. 3 o'clock, I can't build your bed of That's how significant little kids learning to rise. That's how significant it is. Now... Rav Amnuna says Yerushalayim was destroyed Mishum only because little kids were in the street instead of the classroom. Why was Bet HaMikdash destroyed? Why was Yerushalayim destroyed? Because the parents, instead of sending them to go learn Torah, they sent them to camp to go play with water. They sent him to go play baseball. They play. They sent him to go play football, like the goyim. That's why Bet Hamikdash was destroyed. All these camps with rabbis there that go camping with them together. If they teach him Torah, Ashrem. But if the whole camp is based on them climbing mountains and going on on, uh, on slides, we have a problem. Why? Because the Torah of the little baby, the little 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year old, that Torah is the only reason why the world is still here. Now, there are other reasons. Amar Av Rav Yudah says, Lo charva Yerushalayim, ela bishvil she bizu ba talmidei chachamim. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because they demean Torah scholars. As it is written at the end of the book of Chronicles, Chronicles 2, chapter 36, verse 16, it recounts the last years of the monarchy of Israel and the destructions at the hand of the Babylonians. Babylon is today Iraq. And the verse says, And Hashem, the God of the father of their fathers, sent to them messengers early and repeatedly because he had compassion for his people and on his dwelling. 
but they mocked the messengers. So Rav Yehuda says, this was the last straw. Hashem sent Am Yisrael messengers. He sent them Kiruv rabbis. Go do tshuva. Why did he send them? He said he didn't want to destroy them. Hashem loves them. It's, there's his kids. It's his house. He doesn't want to kill them. He didn't create us to kill us. There's much more creative ways to destroy us if you want to simply destroy us. He says, I love you. You're my kids. I love you. You say Shema Yisrael every day, right? I know you don't really mean it, but you say it though. I love you. Yeah, I love you. Kids, all the things. I love you. So I don't want to destroy you. But there's rules. Oh, you don't know the rules? Oh, okay, fine. I'll send you messengers. He sent the prophets. He sent the Kiruv rabbis. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets. Until the wrath of God rose upon again against his people until there was no remedy. This was the final sin of the people. Because once Hashem saw that they're mocking the people that are there to help him, he realized that there is no hope for them to do tshuva. And once a person, a sinner is shown that he's doing a, he's making an error. And a person comes to him to help him to do tshuva. If that person, if that sinner has fallen to such a level of sin that he actually starts mocking the person that's trying to save him, there's no longer any hope for him. His wound has become too severe to be healed, says the Maosha. We learn this here. That once Am Yisrael starts going against Kiruv, Hashem says there's no hope. Why? It's the only way you're going to do tshuva. Yes, but what about uh, the regular rabbi? What about the local rabbi? What about the uh, nice rabbi that says I love you? What about him? So continue. We'll continue. Amar Amram. Rav Amram, the son of Rabbi Shimon, it says the whole lineage of how it got to Rav Amram, who got it originally from Rabbi Shimon Baraba, in the name of Rabbi Hanina. It says Yerushalayim was only destroyed because they did not rebuke one another. Shenemar. It says in the um, Lamentations, the book of Echa, first chapter, verse 6. Its leaders were like hearts that found no pasture. So the Chachamim learned from this that Hashem is using an analogy to define the rabbis of the generation. The rabbis of the generation were like these hearts that walk in a herd with the head of one behind the tail of another. So did the Israelites of that generation bury their faces in the ground to avoid seeing, avoid seeing the wrongdoing around them. And therefore they did not have to admonish each other. In so many words, the leaders of the generation were up each other's butt is what he's literally saying here. And hiding their heads in the sand. Why? Oh, he drove to Shul. I, I didn't see him. I didn't see him drive to Shul. I didn't see him. No, no, you remember, he drove. It's his car right there. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Uh, he's cheating on his wife. No, how do you know? It's Lashonara. It's Lashonara. You don't have to say he's cheating on his wife. No, no, but I saw him. They came to my, he came to my house with his girlfriend. No, maybe it's his daughter. No, she's 20 years older than him. No, no. It's Lashonara. It's Lashonara. Don't say Lashonara. Everyone is just removing themselves. No, don't say it. Don't say it. Why? No, no. Why you saying Lashonara? But I'm Israel. Why are you saying I'm Israel is Mechal Shabbat? One time I said, you know, 19 statistically, PW research came out, said that over 90% of American Jews are Mechal Shabbat. 90%. Hashem Yerachem. If you have, if you have 6 million Jews in America, 5.4 million drive on Shabbat. Now, that's bad enough, right? 
The other part of this research says, but 94%, 94% of American Jews think it's okay to do business on Shabbat. Meaning that 40% of the ones that keep Shabbat kind of work on Shabbat. Meaning even the, even the 10% that actually keep Shabbat, they're not so good either. Now I said this one time in a shield, like, oh, why Lashon Ara and Am Yisrael? Yo, yo, Yetzara, it's one guy called me, yo, Yetzara, you're the Satan himself, he tells me, why, I made these people Mechale Shabbat. Why say Lashon Ara? So we're going to hide from it? This is what happened at the time of the Bet HaMikdash. We hid from the truth to such an extent. No, no, don't say Lashon Ara, don't say Lashon Ara. This liberal mentality is not new. This liberal mentality was even around at the time of the Bet HaMikdash. The Rabbi Yitzchak says here in his Gemara, Lo charva Yerushalayim, ela bishvi shoshvu katan vegadol. Yerushalayim was destroyed only when the small and the great were considered equal, meaning everyone gets a participation award. Yeah, but he's the winner. He's the smartest guy in class. He won the competition. No, no, no. It's not nice. If he gets the award and no one else gets, they're all going to feel bad. Yeah, but they should. They lost. It's fine. Maybe they'll fight harder next time to get a good grade. No, everyone gets an A. Yeah, but they, all, they, all, they didn't answer any questions. The one of the guy didn't even come. No, but we, 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 if we give him an F, he's going to feel bad about himself. It could traumatize him. Chas v'shalom. Chas v'shalom. You're traumatized. Yeah, but he's going, to be, he's going to be illiterate at 25 years old if you keep going this way. No, he participated. What do you mean? The, the, the zvu participated also. The fly came participating. You're going to give him a diploma also? That's what's happening. Not new. Shlomo Melech wrote in the Torah, nothing new under the sun, seven times. Seven times he wrote it. Think he was joking? No. Nothing new under the sun. Liberalism was alive and well at the time of the Bet Mikdash. If that was not enough, Lo Charva Yerushalayim Ela Mipne Shelo Ayalayim Boshet Panim Zemi Zeh. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because they had no shame for each other. What does it mean they had no shame? That even when a person would go against and, and hurt another person, they would literally do it in their face. Now why is this so bad? Why is it so bad not to have busha? Why is it so bad not to have busha? Because the vast majority of us don't make certain sins we want to make. There are certain sins all of us want to make. All of us have evil inside us. We have yetzara. All of us have Yetzirah. That's a reality. Reality. I'm included here. I'm also human. Believe it or not. So, no matter what everybody else says, I'm human. I'm it. So anyway, all of us have evil in us. All of us want to do evil things. Why don't we do them? It's not really because we're scared of God. Tachlis. Bottom line, it's not really because we're scared of God. Yes, there are certain things we're scared of God. We're scared of getting known. We're scared of losing money. We're scared of getting sick. We're scared of uh, a lot of things. But there are certain sins, sometimes we don't really care what God says. Certain things. But we still don't do them. Why? Because we're scared of the neighbor. We're scared of the community. We're scared of the somebody that's going to think something. The guy has a lot of money, he wants to start a new business, and he says, somebody tells him, listen, this is great business. What? It's a uh, nightclub. It's a nightclub. Now, the guy that's religious... He's going to think twice. Why? It's like, yeah, if I open this nightclub, they're going to kick my kids out of yeshiva. They're going to kick me out of the community. Why? They're going to say, well, what, kind of, what kind of Jew are you? You have a nightclub for the goyim, for the this, for all the sins there, the prostitution, immodesty, all that stuff. That's what you have. So it's not that he's not opening the nightclub or the strip club or the bar, or all the god, god nefesh, all that stuff because he actually cares about Hashem. No, it has nothing to do with Hashem. Because he's scared of the neighbor, he's scared of the yeshiva, he's scared of this one, he's scared of that one. That's why in Israel, by the way, there are certain communities that if they see that you have a smartphone, they kick your kids out of school. Bimit. There are certain communities that are so, like, so makpidim, I think it's a little overboard in my opinion, 
that if they see that the parent has a smartphone, they kick the kid out of the kindergarten. They don't let him in. They don't accept him. Because the parent has a smartphone. Why? Because if he has a smartphone, it must mean he's looking at pornography. And in some places, some people are a little bit cuckoo. If they see another guy, they don't know him. They don't know the guy. This has actually already happened. I know a few stories that happened. They see a guy carrying a smartphone. They take the smartphone out of his hand. They smash it on the floor. And they start yelling at him, Rasha, Rasha, what are you doing, Rasha? Now, now here's the problem. Here's the problem. A lot of people say this rule in the name of Rav Kanievsky. Rav Kanievsky never wrote anything. Whether he said it or he didn't say it is a different story. I don't know, I wasn't there. But until somebody writes something, it's as if it never existed. We don't learn Allah from hearsay. That's not how we learn Allah. We learn Allah from what's in books. If it's in a book, it's emet. If, as long as it's not in a book, it's your opinion that you said his name on it. But the reality is, what is it worse? Someone having a smartphone in their hand that maybe he's making a sin, maybe not. Or you taking his goods, that's not yours, against his will, which is gezel, and then destroying it. Which one is worse? Of course it's destroying it. Why? Because you're assuming he's making a sin. Maybe he's not. You're assuming he's making a sin, but maybe he's not. And even if he is making a sin, he's making a sin alone. He's not involving you. He's not involving anybody else. Whereas you, taking his goods and destroying them in public and then embarrassing him in public, you just lost Olam Abba. Why? Number one, you just embarrassed another Jew in public. Number two, you stole. You cannot enter Gan Eden until you return the money. Number three, Chilul Hashem. So people, sometimes they forget what the Torah says and they let their emotions get the best of them and they lose their mind. They lose their mind. Now here's the thing. Sometimes a person is going to have a really good reason to have a smartphone. Why? He's doing Kiruv with it. It's for his job or whatever it is. Sometimes he doesn't have a real good reason for it. Either way, you have no right to take the law into your hands. But the bottom line is that there are a lot of things that we do because we want to do them. There's a lot of things that we don't do, even though we want to do them, because they don't want us to do it. So, Ula says over here, Yerushalayim was destroyed when there was no distinguishing. Why? No one ever stopped doing something because somebody else is not going to like it. That even that last measure of protection that you have, fine, you don't have, uh, you don't have embarrassment in front of Hashem, which is already bad enough. Now you don't even have embarrassment in front of each other. So there's no protection whatsoever, meaning all hell is going to break loose. The same generation here, the same generation as Noah. Same generation as Sodom and Gomorrah. No difference. Why? No busha. Today's generation, Rabotai Karim, unfortunately, is not different at all. People have no busha. They do their business in the middle of the street. Whether their business is to relieve themselves or their business is to uh, make kids in the middle of the street. They're proud of it. They make movies about it. They write stories about it. They tell people about it. This is the world we live in. There's no busha. Meaning that Mashiach has to come very soon. Now if that wasn't enough, Lo Charva Yerushalayim, Rabbi Abahu says, Rabbi Abahu says, Lo Charva Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim was destroyed. Why? Because they neglected to recite the Shema in the morning and the evening. What we started the Shiu as Shema Israel was not recited anymore. Why? Is Shema Israel that important? It's important, but it's not important enough for Hashem to destroy the to destroy the world on the Beit Hamikdash. So, what's the real reason? The real reason is because the, why they didn't recite the, the uh, Shema Yisrael. The prophet Jeremiah says, Oy Woe to those that rise early in the morning 
and pursue old wine that linger late into the night to wine and flames them. It says the real reason of why they did not say Kriyachma is because they went out partying at night. So they didn't say Shema at night because they had a couple of drinks. They were too busy having a couple of drinks at case space. They wanted to have a couple of drinks. Shiduch party. They wanted to have, instead of go to Shiul Torah or to go to Tefillah, they wanted to go and have a couple of drinks. Okay, what's the problem? You miss one Kriyat Shema. What's the bigger problem? You're going to wake up late tomorrow. You're going to wake up at noon. So that means you, let, you miss two Kriyat Shema. And once it becomes a habit, you forget that you're even connected to God. Everyone goes off the derech. Lo charva Yerushalayim ela bishvi shechilelu ba et ha-shabbat. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because they desecrated Shabbat. Now what does the one have to do with the other? As I said before, Shabbat is the equivalent of the covenant that is between us and Hashem, that without it there's no purpose to the world. The Gemara says in another place that when a person keeps Shabbat, he's acting as a witness, as a witness for Hashem Barach that he is testifying that Hashem created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, even though he wasn't there, He's testifying, I believe. And that means that when someone violates Shabbat, he's testifying the opposite. He's saying, no, no, you didn't create the world. In fact, he's running in the middle of the street saying, no, Hashem, I don't believe you created the world. I don't believe. In this Rabotai, the Gemara says that when a Jew violates Shabbat, he's considered 100% like an idol worshiper. He's considered 100% like someone that worships Buddha or somebody that worships J.C. Penny, or somebody that worships money, or somebody that worships a rabbi, or a wall, or a motorcycle, or any of those things, everything but Hashem. Yeah, but it's just, he just drove on Shabbat. He didn't do all those other things. He didn't worship the rabbi. He didn't do all those things. He just uh, drove on Shabbat. What's the big deal? The big deal, Rabotai, is the fact that if you believe in the blessing that you say, then you'll understand why Chilul Shabbat means so much. When you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, when you say any blessing starts the same way. Blessed you Hashem, the King of the world. Now, Rav Desler Alav HaShalom used to say, The stupidest thing in the world for a person to do is to make Hashem king over everyone else except himself. Bless you, Hashem, king of the world, except me. What would happen? Because if everyone did it, if everyone says, no, no, Hashem is the king of the world, except me, except me, I, I do my own thing. If everyone said, it's the king of the world, except me, except me, except me, he would be king of nothing. King of nothing. So when you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, King of the world, King of the world, that means that He's your King. If He's your King, that means you have to comply with what He says, not what you think. So, by violating Shabbat, you're going against His rule. Now He actually says there's 39 different restrictions on Shabbat. But there's one specific one that's literally written in the Torah. There's only one that's written in the Torah. And that is, don't light fire. Everything else we understand from the Torah, from the building of the Bet HaMikdash. But there's really one specific thing that's written in the book of Exodus that Hashem says, don't do on Shabbat. And what is that? Don't light fire. And that's why the same Gemara says, Rav Yehuda, the son of Rav Shmuel, said in the name of Rav, fires are not common except in a place where there is Shabbat desecration. Any time you will see a fire, you'll also see Michalel Shabbat. One connects to the other. Why? This is measure for measure. This is measure for measure. And that's why Beta Mikdash was destroyed to the point of extinction. Burned to the ground, to ashes. Why? Because there was Chilul Shabbat. 
Once there's Chilu Shabbat, there's Chilu Hashem. Once there's Chilu Hashem, there's nothing. There's simply nothing. Now, here we see that desecrating Shabbat is a much bigger deal than what we thought to such an extent that Hashem destroyed the world or at least the spiritual aspect of this world by destroying his own home, his own house here. But we see that it wasn't just one sin like we thought most of our life. Oh yeah, they just because they made some sex crimes or because they worshipped an idol or because they... Uh, no, no. There's a lot more to it. Why? You see how each one of these big topics has subcategories. And there's many, many more that it goes into. But you get the point. Now, if that wasn't enough, we're going to go into slightly more detail. The Avot de Rabbi Natan says there are three things that a person can lose this world and the next world for, which happen to be all three sins that destroyed the Bet Migdash. Someone that worships an idol loses this world. Why? Your whole, world, your whole life you're praying to the wrong God. Imagine. Imagine Chash Shalom, a person literally prays every day, Buddha, help me, Buddha, help me, Buddha, help me, Buddha, help me. And Buddha is not saying anything. Why is a statue that you just bought from China for $15? Oh, but Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. And then Jesus, help me, help me I'm in Gainom. Why am I help you? Help me, I'm in Gainom. Take me out of here. You're praying to Jesus the whole time, the guy's in Gainom. Why is he going to help you? The whole, your whole life you spent praying to this guy. Imagine, imagine. What a miserable life. You go up to Shammai and say, No, what happened to you? How come you worship a guy? No, I worship Jesus. He goes, Yeah, you can right there. No, see, you see all the boiling feces over there? That's this department. No. How come you never ask any, never ask any questions? Imagine your whole life. You're in this world, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. You're praying to the wrong God. So, the, so Avot the Rabbi Natan, the saint says, You lost this world and you lost the next world. Also, if you spill blood. Spilling blood has multiple meanings, one of them obviously being murder. Anyone that murders is never going to be able to forget it, even if the murder was accidental. Even, you see a lot of the soldiers, God bless them, that they protect the country, whether it be the U.S. or Israel or so on, anywhere that Jews live. Soldiers, unfortunately, after they leave battle, they have something called post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of them have this traumatizing life, this traumatizing experience that destroys their life. Why? They killed somebody, or they saw their friend being killed. And in reality, these people suffer for the rest of their life. And it's not enough that they suffer that they see death. Their own former bosses, the government, don't even give them any benefits. Don't even give them any real financial security. There's many of them that are homeless. Homeless, homeless, my much homeless in the streets. Homeless people that actually protected, you know, the people that live in this country. They're actually homeless in the streets. Terrorists, terrorists, they give them, they put them at least in jail and they give them a, they give them a place to eat. They give their families uh, welfare. They give their families uh, benefit plans and, uh, and money and so on. But the people that actually protected the country, they leave them in the street, go die. Mama, it's the craziest level of stupidity in the world. It's no different in Israel. The terrorists, their families get money from the government every month. But a Jewish soldier that leaves the army, nothing, gets nothing. Zero. Many of them go broke, go crazy, go... Such of an upside-down world. But from here we learn that when a person sees, when a normal human being that was created in the image of God, meaning he's able to decipher right and wrong, sees blood in his hands of another human being, his state of mind is forever traumatized. I remember when my mom used to tell us a story about my grandfather, I love a shalom, Saba Gavriel. Saba Gavriel was a tzaddik. He was living in Tripoli, and he was his family were giborim. They were heroes. 
of the town when the, the Arabs would uh, kidnap the Jewish girls the Jews were afraid to go into the Arab camp because they would kill them the Arabs would kill them so Saba Gavriel my grandfather him and his brothers would go into the Arab camp dressed like Arabs became friendly with them and take the girls out and save them now also when the war broke broke out and there was bombs everywhere and there were dead people everywhere one of the worst things in the world is what's the after effect why it's not just that people die you have to bury the bodies sometimes the body is in a few places sometimes the arm is over here the head is over here the fingers over here what do you think everybody dies like they go to sleep this is what happens so my grandfather, Allah Shalom, would go and take the bodies and bury them. Give the Jew the respect to get a burial, a righteous burial. And he would bury him at night, he would bury him. So he would tell my, my mom and her sisters and brothers these stories on Shabbat. He would tell them how he would bury these people. And he would tell him, listen, you know, I, all the people that I ever buried, I see their faces in my hands. Because blood was everywhere. And apparently part of the neshama, this is some supernatural stuff, I don't understand, I'm just telling you what I heard. He says, I would see their faces for the rest of my life. I look at my hands, I see their faces on my hands. All of these people, all these neshama that I buried, I see their faces on my hands. Shem yachem. Just saying the story, I get scared. So my mom asked him, Abba, aren't you scared? Aren't you scared seeing all these ghosts? And you used to tell me, so ghosts and neshamot in the, in the, in, in, in the cemetery it was at night. Go, all types of uh, things that are beyond this world. And she says, Abba, aren't you scared? She says, Binchi, my daughter, only be scared of living people, not the ones that are dead. Because the living ones are the ones that can hurt you. Such is the wisdom of the previous generation. Us, we're scared of the ghosts. We're scared of the things that uh, we can't see, we can't touch, we can't anything. But we forget that the biggest enemy could be sitting right next to us. Could be the guy that's giving us a paycheck. Could be the guy that's getting a paycheck. So we see that when a person sees another person's blood, obviously it makes an impact on them. A person could literally lose if they're not right in their mind, if they don't have enough Torah. They could literally lose this world and the next. And the next one is Gilu'e Arayot, someone that makes a sex crime, whether it's incest, which is the obvious that everyone knows about, or it's even something as simple as wasting seed. A lot of people think that wasting seed is a victimless crime. In reality, they don't realize that the biggest victim, the biggest victim is not only the person that's wasting seed, but also his potential wife. Many marriages are destroyed because of wasting seed and no one knows why. People get divorces. Suddenly, I don't love you anymore. Why don't you love me? What happened? How come you love me for 10 years? How come you love me for 20 years? Why don't you love me now? No, the love was dying for a long time. Why? Because he has a new girlfriend. Who's the new girlfriend? Himself. Permit. Once a person gets to such an extent of addiction, of wasting seed, he starts to lose respect and love for his spouse and he starts feeling like he doesn't need her. Because the feeling that he gets, or he thinks he gets, he gets in two minutes without what he thinks is a headache, and it is, and I'll have to deal with it, and so on and so forth, and he literally, systematically destroys his marriage with his own hands. So wasting seed is not just a shield you give to 15-year-old kids so they don't go to Gainom forever. Yes, of course, you're supposed to teach the 15-year-old kids so they don't go to Gainom forever because this is one of the three sins that the Rashid Chokhmah says if a person does this in Mezid, he goes to Gainom and he doesn't leave. 
Mashiach comes, saves everyone else except him. So wasting seed is a big deal. Of course, we're supposed to teach it to all the young guys. Teenagers, in their 20s, in their 30s. But it doesn't end there, Rabotai. It doesn't end there. The Shulchan Aruch does not call it the biggest sin in the entire Torah for nothing. If it was only because it's a problem when you're not married, then it would, it would be a sin, but not the biggest sin in the Torah. It's called the biggest sin in the Torah because the addiction can last an entire lifetime, even if you're married with ten kids. It doesn't make a difference. If you don't understand the significance of the sin, both on this world and the next, you will be addicted to it and you will destroy yourself in every way, shape, or form. Once a person wastes seed and becomes addicted to it, his Torah becomes non-existent. He has no interest in learning Torah. Even a Torah that he learns, he doesn't understand. He's bored of it constantly. He goes to sleep constantly while learning. He has no energy for it. He has no energy for Kedusha. He becomes an atheist. He becomes arrogant. All of the worst midot in the world become glued to his neshama. Even if he's married. And that's why a lot of the couples that come to me for advice for different things, part of the things that I try to find out in a nice way is where the husband stands in regards to this addiction. 99% of the, 99 of the time, the husband has an addiction to wasting seed. And that is part of the big reason of why a lot of marriages have problems. Unfortunately, in the religious world, some of the so-called religious husbands forgot to learn this halakha and they get to such a level of addiction of watching pornography and, and doing all of those things that they feel there's really no need to be intimate with their wives anymore. Why? Because they feel like if they're intimate with their wife they're going to have a kid and they don't want to have another kid. Kids a headache, more money, all this nonsense that people put in their head of why they don't want to have a kid. No, I don't want to pay for another kid. I don't want a headache of another kid. I don't want this of another kid. So they decide, I don't want to have another kid. But I still need to uh, fulfill my physical desires. So what does the guy do? He makes the bathroom his new girlfriend. And that's what happens. So many of these wives, many of these wives actually contact me, and I'm sure other rabbis, and they say, my husband does not want to be with me. So first I try to find out if he has a girlfriend. It's, it's one or the other. Does he have a girlfriend? Does he have a boyfriend? Is it something? Today you have to ask, boyfriend or girlfriend. You have to ask. Sometimes it is. Believe it or not, most of the time there's no boyfriend, there's no girlfriend. Most of the time it's the bathroom. Most of the time it's because he's addicted to pornography. And he's so addicted to it, to get him back into the bedroom with his wife is, uh, you need, ooh, what? how much, how many shurim? You need a lot of shurim. And that's why sometimes he wants his wife to do unusual things, things that are against the Torah and all types of things. Why? This is all lack of education. Lack of education. It's not that we're evil people. It's not that they're bad people. They're all wonderful people. They're all the children of Hashem Barach. Problem is, they, the teachers skip this chapter. So many people don't know it's a problem until it's really a problem. And that's why Rabbi, Avot de Rabbi Natan says, this Gilui Arayot, this wasting seed, this sex crime, is something that could cause a person to lose this world and the next. So now we see that all three of these sins are sins that could literally destroy our lives here and the next world. But there's the Chidush that Avot de Rabbi Natan wants to add. What's the Chidush? Lashon Ara is worse than all three combined. Saying Lashon Ara is worse than Gilu Arayot, Shfichu Damim, and Avodah Zara. Why? How, do we, how, how could such a thing be? First example is the fact that we see that these three major sins were the reasons why we did, the first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed. 70 years later, after the destruction, Hashem built the second Bet HaMikdash. The second Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. Sinat Chinam 
baseless hatred. And Avot the Rabbi Natan says, this baseless hatred, and he's not the only one, many of the sages explain, what is this baseless hatred? This baseless hatred is Lashonara. What does it mean, baseless hatred? You're going to not like him, and you're going to tell people how you feel. Oh, no, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't listen to him. Don't go to the Shurim. No, him? No, I think he's Ashkenazi, Sephardi. I don't know. It's not, it's not, it's not from us. It's not like us. It's not like us. Don't go there. Don't go there. It's not like us. It's not like one of us. It's, like, it's, like, it's like unusual. It's like, Baal Tshuva, no. It's a, Baal Tshuva, you know. About those Baal Tshuvas, you know. They, they can always turn back. They always turn back. Oh, convert. Ooh, wah. Hatano Avinu Pashano. Convert. Ooh, you know, okay, you can befriend them. You can invite them. You can invite them to dinner, but you're not going to marry You're not going to marry their kids. You know, it's, it's convert. It's like, a, it's like a half a Jew. I had somebody tell me this. He says, I love your shurim. He tells me, I love your shurim. Your story is amazing. You know, wow. I don't know why people, you know, this, that, or the intermarriage. It's crazy. Wow, yeah. I would never marry a convert. It's like a half a Jew. He's telling me this. This is the stupidity of people. But this, this Rabotai, this is Sinat Chinam. This is Lashonara. This is constantly happening every single day in our people, among us. People say Lashonara. Now the Gemara Masechet Nedarim, page 64b, says there are four types of people that are considered dead. Ani Metzora Ivel. Four people that are considered dead, someone that's poor, someone that has tzarat, someone that's blind, and someone that cannot have children. So, here we see, the Gemara tells us these four people are considered like they're dead. Rabbi Fahim explains, he says, if you notice, no one talks Lashonara against those people. Anytime you say Lashon Ara, the guy tells, no, no, he's poor. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, poor. He's scared. He just lost all of his money. Oh, he's scared. Yeah, you're just saying that you hate him. No, 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 not a different guy. Behind him, behind him. He just lost all of his money. All of a sudden, he's sadiq. Or he said, the guy, you know, the guy who's this. Oh, no, he has a sickness, cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, he's scared. He's scared. All of a sudden, no Lashon Ara on the cancer patient. Metzora, he has disease. Say, oh, why is he looking? No, no, he's not looking. He's blind. Oh, oh, tzaddik. Yeah, he's probably like, uh, he's probably like one of those tzaddikim. He sees kedusha. You were just saying, you're just saying lashon hara about him two seconds ago. And the same thing you tell the guy. Mush, I heard a story myself. One time, I said, I, I, I it. There was a guy. Did shuva. He came to meet chacham. He stabach shimol amash. Something amazing. And uh, I asked. I, I'm telling you my own story. This is my own shame. My own shame. So I tell, I ask my rabbi, like, uh, wow. So I heard one of his lectures. The guy's Talmud Chacham, Bimei. Mamash, really sharp. I'm like, how long is he doing tshuva? It's like 10 years only. Wow. 10 years, he knows all this stuff. And he's popular too. He has, he says himself, he has, uh, I don't know, maybe four or five lectures a day. Each lecture he gets uh, maybe like uh, five, six hundred dollars. I mean, the guy is not only successful in Torah, he's also making a lot of panasa. So me, I'm like fired up a little bit. I'm like a little jealous. A little jealous. He knows so much Torah. Wow. And on top of it, he's doing okay. Wow. Amazing. I'm, I'm feeling myself. I'm telling you my own, my own shame. I'm feeling myself. And then my rabbi told me, he goes, yeah, and he also has an autistic son. All of a sudden, I'm like, wow, what a tzaddik. Wow, wow, hashrab. All of a sudden, me and my shame, I go down and become a loser again. Why? I say, why could you be jealous of a person? I'm like, it's not worth it for all of that. It's not worth it. What kind of difficulty it is. All of those parents that have these special kids, first of all, they should realize anyone that's autistic is a tzaddik, is a neshama of a tzaddik, inside, inside that person. Why? They have a limited tikkun. They have a limited tikkun in this world, not like us. Hashem is limiting their ability to make sins. But the parents themselves also, obviously, they have a certain significance that they can overcome and so on and so forth. 
But that's not a tikkun that I, that I could ever say myself, that I could ever do. But I see my own shame. I say to myself, oh, he's successful in this, successful in this, successful in this. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't say anything. But all of a sudden, as soon as he said he has this tikkun, I'm like, wow, what a tzaddik, wow, what a tzaddik. Why? Because as soon as he, somebody has such a big tikkun, you're like, no, you don't say Lashonara. So here we see, we learn from this Gemara, if you notice, any time you mention something about somebody that died, he says, no, come on, you can't talk about them. Well, it says somewhere, it says in one of those books, somewhere in a library, in a book, in a somewhere, in a somewhere, you're talking about people that died. They're all tzaddikim. Yeah, but the guy killed 80 people on the way out. No, no, it's tzaddik. So you don't talk about him once he died. You don't talk about him once he died. Meaning, we have a, once they're, if they're alive, we have, shh, say whatever you want about them. But if they're dead, they're all tzaddikim. See, so here's the thing. Notice that if someone died or is considered like he's dead, there's no Lashonara. But if he's alive, there is Lashonara. There's non-stop Lashonara. Why? Because the reality is that the root of all Lashonara, the root of all Lashonara is jealousy. You do not say Lashonara against someone that has less than you. You do not say Lashonara it's against someone that has something that you have a thousand more. Who do you say Lashonara against? You say Lashonara against someone that has something you don't have. So if he's blind, no Lashonara. Why? Because you can see. If he's poor, no Lashonara. Why? Because you have more money than you can count. If he's dead, well, he's not my competition anymore. He died. He's not my competition anymore. He doesn't want my job. He doesn't want my wife. He doesn't want my kids. He doesn't want anything. He's dead. He's saying, yeah, he's Sadiq, Sadiq. Yeah, sure, whatever you want. He's not, he's not a threat to me anymore. He's not a threat to me. Who am I going to say Lashonara against? Against the guy that could potentially be liked by others more than me. Against the guy that could potentially take my job. Against the guy that could potentially get more attention to me. Against competition. The root of all Lashonara is your ego, your jealousy. That's Lashonara. And that's why Avote Rabbi Natan says it's worse than everything else. Because one of the Chidushim that I learned just in the last few days I guess it was your merit. Is that if you notice, Hashem said in the Torah that when there's an arrogant person, he cannot be in the same room as him. Gemara says it. Shlomo Melech says it. Ga'avat Adam Tashpilenu. The pride will come before the fall. Hashem is disgusted by person, a person that has gava, has pride. Toivat Hashem kol gvalev. Anyone that's prideful is considered disgusting in the eyes of Hashem. And Hashem literally says that a person that is pride, he cannot be in the same room as him. If you notice, Hashem detests pride. If you also notice, the root of all atheists is pride. Every single atheist that exists in the world and ever exists in the world is an arrogant, prideful person. Hashem says, I cannot be in the same room as them because they're prideful. The arrogant person says, there is no Hashem. He's right. In his life, Hashem is not there. Hashem cannot be next to him. Now what's his pride about? What does he have so much pride about? The pride is, he doesn't want any rules. He doesn't want any rules. He doesn't want anyone. The root of atheism, it's not that they don't really believe that, the, that something created everything. It's not about that. It's about having so much pride that you make your own rules and no one's going to tell you what to do. You're not going to submit to any system to any rule, to anyone, everyone is below you or at the very best case scenario, just like you. No one's above you. Everyone's the same or less than you and no one's going to tell you what to do. That is the root of all atheism. 
And Rabotai Karim, that comes from pride. Rabotai Karim, pride is worse than everything else. So when you say Lashonara, you're only saying Lashonara because of your pride. Because there's no way that I'm going to let him take my job. There's no way that I'm going to let him take my attention. There's no way that I'm going to let him take my time. There's no way that I'm going to let him do anything because maybe I want to do it sometimes. So what do you do? You destroy him. You destroy. There's no way that he's right and I'm wrong. There's no way that he's right and I'm wrong. So you destroy him. And that's why the Torah says that is worse than everything. That pride leads to Lashonara. That Lashonara will lead to all of the sins in the world, to idolatry, to sex crimes, to wasting seed, to every sin in the entire Torah. Because once your pride is at the steering wheel, nothing is going to control it. Nothing is going to stop it. You're going to make every sin on the way to Gehenom. Every single sin. And that's why they say that Reshaim even at Petach Gehenom, even at the gate of Gehenom, do not do tshuva. Even at the gate of Gehenom. Why? Because their pride is so big that even at the gate of Gehenom, they cannot admit, yeah, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I should do tshuva. No. Even at the gate of Gehenom, they're still, no, no, I think I was right. I think there's maybe something wrong with the system. I think I was allowed to do that. I think I'm going to find a way out. They're so prideful, they cannot see the wrong in themselves. And that's what we learned last week, or the week before, that a person, the Gemara Masechet Shabbat says, a person does not see the wrong in himself. It's not that there's no wrong. It's that he can't see it in himself. He can only see it in everybody else. And that, Rabotai, is what caused all of the Lashon in the world, all of the Shfichut Damim, all of the Chilut Shabbat, all of the wasted seed, all of the Avodah Zarah, all of the disaster that ever existed from the beginning of time until today is all starting from pride. All of it. That's also the reason of why the teachers have failed time and time again. Why? They have too much pride to say, by the way, I was wrong. You're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. By the way, I was wrong. You're not allowed to marry her. She's a not Jew. By the way, I was wrong. They have too much pride to admit they're wrong. They have too much pride to say, listen, we got to change. So what happens? The Kila invites me. They want me to come. They say, oh, send us some CD. Send us some CDs. I send the CDs. The rabbi gets it and he hides them. And then they call me three, four, five months later. Like, oh, how come you never send us the CD? What do you mean? I invested a thousand dollars in your kila. I sent you a thousand dollars worth of merchandise. CDs, a Sharyatsar cards, books, everything. I sent. I sent it. Made a p- attention to your rabbi in Australia, your rabbi in Montana, your rabbi in Gainom, your rabbi wherever he was. I sent it. Every single, every single person that ever asked for something, I sent. We sent for the shipping. The shipping cost a ton of money. The CDs cost a ton of money. The, everything cost a ton of money. We sent it. You didn't want to send the money. We sent you the stuff. Whether you send the money or not is up to you. Well, how come nothing ever happened? Because the rabbi was too arrogant to say, oh yeah, maybe there's something else you're going to learn from this. Oh, what do you do? You throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the garbage. You hide it. And it's not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times. A bunch of times it happens. Why do you have to I, I, can't, I can't get there. I can't fly everywhere with the CDs. But you have to ship them and he throws it away? No, I ship it. Without no, I ship it to people. I send it to them and then they sometimes they never get it. Why don't they get it? Because the rabbi is throwing it out. Even a kila over here. In, 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 in Florida, a rabbi, I gave the CDs in the rabbi's hand next to his congregants. I gave it to them. And then, you know, a few months passed. People forgot. They got busy with life and so on. And I asked him, did you ever give your, my CDs to your key? I asked the people, he goes, oh, no, I don't think anybody ever saw it. I said, why not? I gave, remember, I had the shiur at the house. We had the shiur, and I gave it to the rabbi. He goes, yeah, and then one of the people goes and checks the rabbi's house. The rabbi was hiding the CDs. The rabbi was hiding the CDs. Why? Chas v'shalom, somebody's going to do tshuva. Chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom. Chas v'shalom, somebody's going to do tshuva. So, Rabotai, all of this comes from pride. All of this. 
Everyone's worried about Lashon Ara. Everyone's worried about Chilul Shabbat. Everyone's worried about Gilu Arayot and Shvichut Damim and all of these Avodah Zara and so on. Yes, you're right. All of those are problems. They're all problems. But there's one thing we can do to solve all of them. Learn Musal, learn Yirat Shemaim, and eliminate our pride. Once you eliminate the pride, by default, the rest of them will be eliminated like a domino effect. But if you work on Shabbat, okay, so maybe it convince you to keep Shabbat, but you're still going to curse your wife out every, every Shabbat on the way out. Oh, you didn't care. Hey, ah, oh, what? What happened? Oh, the food wasn't hot. Okay, so that deserves all the curses. The fact that she gave you food that's edible is enough. The fact that she gave you food is enough. You're cursing her? Oh, okay, so I got you to keep Shabbat, but you're still an animal. Oh, another guy, oh no, I stopped wasting seed, everything is good. Yeah, but you're still cheating on your wife, though. You're not to be, the, your, your girlfriend's not the bathroom, it's a different girl now. Uh, what, 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 what is this? Uh, it's all because you made one sin, but you changed with something else. Oh no, he's keeping Shabbat, and he's this, and he's this. And, but all day he talks against me. All day he talks against somebody else. All day Lashonarai, like bullets, come out of his mouth, like bullets. Instead of Chidushim, he comes out with Chidushim on people. And I tell him, no Lashonarai. He goes, so what would I talk about? <laughs> If it's not Hashanah, what would I talk about? If it's not about people, what would I talk about? So that's the thing about time. All of those things are problems. Shabbat, and this, and that. Lashonara, people love to talk about Lashonara. But the reality is you cannot solve that problem without getting to the root. The root is pride. The root is pride. Once we realize, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, once we realize that Hashem is the king of the world, he's the only king, and we submit to him, already pride went down 50%. Then we learn more and more about what does it mean, that I love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my money. What does it actually mean I love him that much? Did I really love him that much? Do I really, really love him that much? With all my heart that everything that I do all day is based on his opinion and not mine? Everything that I do all day is based on what he wants and not what I want. Everything that I do all day is all based on his Torah. All my biggest investments and, and time and resources is only based on his Torah. It's not based on the car and the house and the dish and the Lamborghini and I'm not planning for retirement. All of that, that's for after. Like, if I do all that, once I realize the meaning, then I realize, oh, pride went down another 50%. Then we can become little Moshe Rabbeinus. But until we do that... We could solve a problem here, we could solve a problem here, we could solve a problem here, but the reality is, in the grand scheme of things, this disease is still there. So you put a band-aid on a heart attack. It's nice, looks good, looks like you did something, but you still got AIDS. You still got a problem. You're still dying. And that's what's been happening for 2,000 years. We've been trying to solve one thing, and another one thing, and another one thing. It's nice. We need to solve the core problem. The core problem is we are too prideful, all of us, starting with me. And that's what we learn in Musa. Musa is going to teach us how to evaluate things based on reality, not based on our warped reality, but on reality, and how we're supposed to look up to the tzaddikim, not the Michael Jordans of the world, not the LeBron James of the world. We have to look up to Moshe Rabbeinu. Not like this rabbi from England that said, oh yeah, the best leader that I can think of today is the soccer coach. Soccer coach, that's what you're, gonna, that's what you're telling Am Yisrael? You're telling Am Yisrael to go look up to a soccer coach? Okay, this is the head rabbi of England. Go tell him that. So the point is, Abotai, is that all of this, the root of all of our problems is pride. Once we learn, once we learn Musal, like we're supposed to, then we can start doing tshuva because musal is not something that you just learn. Oh, it's nice, it's entertaining. You delve on it, you think about it, you write it down, you meditate over it, you say, how does this affect me? You start looking in the mirror and look at yourself instead of everybody behind you. And that loud, you start doing tshuva. And you recognize the evil in yourself too. Why? Because the only way to remove it is identifying it first. Any questions? Okay, and I told you guys a story that three weeks ago. And uh, 
in, uh, no, in the shiur in, um, in the shiur in uh, Hollywood. I said this story about a month ago. So you have to watch the shiur. Okay. A uh, student was Rasha, and he, uh, his pride got the best of him, and he wanted his, uh, his rabbi's wife, and he manipulated everything possible until he got what he wanted. And that was one of the last straws that Hashem had. This is one of the things that's it's considered a melacha. Now, uh, ca- r- uh, ripping paper. Ripping paper is considered a melacha. But you should know there is a, uh, a leniency if you're doing it for kvot gufo. So a lot of people are, very, are, are overly strict with it to the extent where they uh, think that you're not allowed to rip any paper. Now, in general, you should avoid ripping all paper. You should avoid ripping all paper. And you should prepare your household to avoid ripping all paper. But if there is a need, and let's say you go to the bathroom and you need toilet paper, then you're able to rip the paper, the toilet paper. Why? Because, yeah, you should do it with shinui. But in general, you're allowed to do it, lechatchila, you're allowed to do it simply because this is the honor of the body. For the sake of honoring the body. You're not allowed, a person should never think that for the sake of not ripping paper, you're allowed to not wipe and then all cause chilul Hashem because you're disgusting and you're walk, walking with filth. And by the way, when you have any filth on you, you're not allowed to pray, you're not allowed to learn, you're not even allowed to be next to people. Uh, so people, sometimes they don't learn the details of the halacha and they think, oh yeah, I, I'm such a tzaddik, I'm not going to rip the toilet paper. Uh, but in reality, you're, you're ignorant rasha because you're, you're making chilul Hashem. So not allowed to rip paper because it's considered a melacha. It's one of the things that they did during the uh, building of the Bet HaMikdash or the, or the Mishkan. Uh, but nonetheless, you are allowed it to do it if it's for the kavod of the body, if it's for the honor of the body, for the sake of cleanliness. In general, what we do in my house is we prepare even uh, toilet paper or things like that or paper towels, we prepare it before Shabbat. It's one of the things you do before Shabbat, but if it happens that you forgot, you're allowed to rip it according to Rav Avadiyah. Uh, but in general, you should prepare before Shabbat. So uh, one thing that you could do also is use wipes. Use wipes. That's uh, you know they're already pre-cut. It's also more hygienic. Uh, you know, uh, in, in general, it's better to use anyway. Next question. Yeah. Uh, you said that story about the tshuva with the year ago. I mean, you said that. Like, oh, you want the story? No, I'm saying like, did he rape her? No. Or, oh, okay. Why, why did she? Why did she say yes? She's like. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you. Okay, so I'll tell you the story. No, so I tell you the story. The story is the Gemara says is that uh, there was a young rabbi with a young wife, um, who one of his students of the kila took a liking, took a liking to the wife. But uh, yeah, he saw, he found, he found, he found her pretty. Gemara Masechet Gitin, page fifty-eight. He found her pretty, and uh, but still he knew that she's a eshet ish. She's married to a, you know to somebody, so he can't do anything. But one time the rabbi asked for a loan because he needed some money, and uh, the guy he lent him the money. When the time, uh, well, I'm sorry, when uh, the the guy was willing to lend him the money, and um, he lent it to him. When the time came to uh, collect it. The guy says, uh, okay, I'm going to pay you. He goes, oh, I send your wife. Send your wife to the house. And uh, I'll give her what you need. He sent the wife to the house, to the guy's house. And uh, she never returned. One day, two days, three days. After a few days, the rabbi asked the guy, have you seen my wife? He goes, yeah, well, she came by my house. And I gave her what, uh, what she uh, needed, and then uh, she left. But I heard that the young guys and the, you know, the, the, the uh, criminals in the neighborhood, they had their way with her. They were bothering her or something. So if she hasn't been at home for three days, that definitely means they probably did something. And if I was you, I wouldn't take her back. He goes, yeah, but the problem is that uh, I have a big tuba. You know, if I divorce her, I have to give her all the money. He goes, ah, oh, don't worry, I'll give you the money. Oh, really? Do me the favor? You give me the money? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you the money. So he lent him the money. 
he got divorced. All this time he doesn't realize that the wife is really at this Rasha's house. She's at his house, She's and he's convincing, he's, of course, he's convincing her to be with him and manipulating him. People that have slick speech, people that are sweet talkers, are able to get other people to do what they want, needless to say, get women to do what they want, especially young women that are naive, like this woman was. And nonetheless, this guy lost his wife. But that wasn't the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story is that this guy's ego was so big, he did not see the wrong in himself. He did not see that there's anything wrong with what he did. Why? Because he said, listen, I didn't touch her when she was married to him. I only touched her after they got divorced and I got married to her. He had a chupah, kiddushin, everything. So one day came and the rabbi was supposed to pay back the loan. And he didn't have the money. He's still a rabbi. He still barely makes minimum wage. So the guy says, listen, you owe me the money. I need the money. I need the money. I need the money. He goes, yeah, I don't have the money. He goes, okay, so you can work for me. Okay, what could I do? He goes, yeah, you could be my uh, chauffeur. You could be my, uh, the guy, my servant in my house. Okay, I'll show up at your house later on. What time? I'll show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. So the rabbi, young rabbi, Miskin, that lost his wife and now in debt, goes to work for his Talmud, who he thought is a Talmud, and goes and makes the coffee, and he comes to give him the coffee, and he sees in the bedroom the guy with his new wife, and who's his new wife? His ex-wife. And his sorrow from seeing all of this and now realizing how everything just happened literally caused him to cry on the spot, and as soon as both of his tears touch the tea or the coffee, Hashem says, for that, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to destroy the Batamidash. Why? Because if the evil of the people has gone to such a level that not only did you steal somebody else's wife, not only did you steal your own rabbi's wife, but you don't even have any busha, you don't have any shame about it, there's no, there's no, there's nothing, there's no saving. And that's what we saw. We saw in the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, what, the Bet HaMikdash was not destroyed until the nation did not have any shame anymore. They lost all of their shame. They would make sins in the open without thinking that there's anything wrong with it. They thought, the guy says, why? Well, I did a mitzvah. I helped him. He needed a loan. I lent him the money. He needed another loan. I lent him the money. He, well, you know, his wife wasn't with him, so I told him to get divorced. The fact that she was with him, he's saying that he, did, he, he closes his eye for his own sins. And I helped him. I gave him the money for the get. I married a woman. I made a mitzvah from the Torah. I married a woman. I chupah, kiddushin, boo, boo. No, why? I'm doing it tzaddik. And that's why the Ramban, the Ramban says a person can follow the entire Torah and be a naval birshut Torah. Still be considered despicable in the name of the Torah with permission from the Torah and lose Olam Abba. Even though he follows the entire Torah, Ma'al Fataf, still be considered despicable. Why? Because there is the obvious laws that Hashem writes, and there's the laws that you're supposed to simply understand. And sometimes people think that if you just do what's written, that's enough. And that's the root of most people's mistakes, is that once you put your pride on the Torah, the Torah says, Loba Shamaimi. Your Torah is no longer from Shamaim. Why? You're tainting it with your pride. Once you're tainting the Torah with your pride, you can learn the entire Shulchan Aruch by heart, backwards and forwards, like the Gaon Mivilna. Gaon Mivilna knew the entire Torah from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning. End to the beginning, beginning to the end. He knew the whole thing by heart. End to the beginning, beginning to the end. You can know the entire Torah from end to beginning, beginning to the end, and it still won't help you. Why? Because your pride destroyed it. And that's why people, people that have pride, that's why they say Lashon Ara. That's why they do all these big sins. Because they don't see us, they don't see wrong in themselves. They don't see wrong in themselves. They think that what they're doing is a mitzvah. They think that, oh, no, no, I'm just telling somebody not to come to Shiu because you made one mistake in five years and it really wasn't a mistake according to most opinions. But in my eyes, it was a mistake. So therefore, I'm warning people. From what? Something. What is it? I'm not really sure, but I'm warning. It's like you didn't find anything else in the world to warn them about. But this is this is this is a, this is pride. This is pride talking. This every single time that 
I've had problems with students in general. It's only because pride got in the way. Every single time. It's never been any other thing. Every single, any, any single issues that you'll ever see, it's only because of pride. There was one time there was a guy that was uh, supposedly a very big fan. Eventually, one day he wrote something that was against the Torah. I told him he's wrong. He decided to make a movie against me. Why? He doesn't, he doesn't like that I told him that he made a sin. It's not allowed. Many people did. You should look up my name. You'll see. Baruch Hashem, many people. Yes, yes. Many people do lectures and movies on me. They like it. They've spent a lot of time investing into my life. I didn't make anything. I'm just saying that they made movies. But the uh, another another guy Can was I a student. Eh, don't waste your time. You should learn to learn that. But uh, another time, another guy thought I was uh, the new Mashiach. I thought I was a Mashiach, everything is good, everything's Kadosh, everything is this, needs Allah for Sukkah, needs Allah for this, a million and a half questions. One day I tell him, oh, listen, by the way, you know, uh, you're rebuking your son, and uh, this particular rebuke wasn't the right rebuke. You're supposed to uh, just let this one go. Why? Because in reality, he didn't do anything wrong. In reality, you're wrong. In reality, you're wrong. He's not wrong. He's right, the kid. So just let it go. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to necessarily apologize to the kid. He's a kid. But still, you're wrong. You shouldn't have done it. You can destroy the kid that way. Ooh, I became Koach. <laughs> I became Koach Ve'adato. Why? I'm no longer Mashiach. I'm Koach. Why? Ah, I rebuked him. This time after time after time after time, I'll tell you. Every single time. That's just the way it is. You have to, everybody loves the truth until it affects them. So the point of Abutai is to understand. If you want to do full tshuva, you want to do full tshuva, you have to work on your midot. Starting with pride. As long as there's pride, you have not completed your tshuva, you have not even begun. Because pride is, pride is a very, very dangerous satan. It's the beginning of all evil. Once you've worked on your pride, once you realize you have it, it's already half the battle. All of us have it. And the reality is you have to identify it. Then we have to start realizing, okay, am I doing this because of my pride or am I doing this because of this? Am I not, I don't, I don't feel like doing it because of this or I don't feel like doing, you know, you have to like start asking yourself this question. You have to do cheshbon nefesh. Why don't I feel like doing it? Why don't I feel like listening to him? Is it because he said it or is it because I disagree? Is it because it's wrong or is it because he said it? You have to, you have to, have to, you have to do cheshbon, that's cheshbon nefesh. Cheshbon Nefesh is, is looking and doing self-accounting. We have to, we're full of it, all of us. We're all full of it. Stop being full of it. Ask yourself, bottom line, why don't I feel like doing this? Why don't I feel like waking up in the morning? Why don't I feel like changing careers? Why don't I feel like marrying this one, having this one? Why is it? What's the point? What's the real root of the cause? Don't tell me it's money and all the superficial stuff. Bottom line, why not? Why not? Why don't you want to go to this one or that one? Why don't you want, why? Why? Okay. You have to identify the root cause. That is real cheshbon nefesh. If you're doing that, then you're doing tshuva. But until we do reflection and self-analysis and start calling ourselves out, yeah, yeah, no, this one, yeah, I'm a real loser on it, but uh, I'll do tshuva. Yeah, this one, worst. But I'll do tshuva. Not like just give up because you're a loser on something. But at least you're identifying, yeah, here I'm good. Oh, Hashem, I learned, da, 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 I'm good at this. But here, this section, loser. Shh. What loser I am. But I got identify where you're a loser. Why? Because that has to be on the to-do list. Don't tell everybody, no, 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 but you know how many mitzvot I do? You know how much stuck I gave? You know how good I am at learning? I can sit there for eight hours learning. I'm like Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. Okay, good. All those things are good. But what about the section you're a loser in? No, me. Come on, Lashon so that's the thing, we have to identify, where are we weak? If you could identify your weaknesses, you could work on them and you could really become something. You could really become something. Any other questions? Or we're finished for the night. Ken. Ken. Ken.
say a, a level down um, on that to be shy in comparison to the children, the kids who have not yet seen. I'll tell you this. When a, uh, I gave an example maybe about a year ago, uh, using my uh, daughter as an example that I saw, I learned this from her, because I first when I learned this uh, sugya, it was baffling to me, because I agreed with Abaye, and with uh, Rabbi Abau, I was saying, what, what about our Torah? So I said, how could it be that a little kid's Torah is more significant than Rabbi Akiva? How could it be a kid's Torah is more significant than even an uh, average Talmud Chacham in today's age? How could it be? Until I saw my little daughter at the time, two years old, do a bracha. Now, she didn't know how to speak uh, 100%, but she knew that you're supposed to do a blessing. And you see her, it's unbelievable. She, 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 you know, she follows my wife, God bless her, and she sets up these uh, little candles and she has three wine cups, and she has all these candles, and she has a chanukiah also, and she has plates and cups and everything, and she puts on this little apron and a kisui rosh, and then she goes like this, and she goes like this with the candles, and then she's two years old, like this, and she starts doing the blessing. Oh, yeah, you don't understand a single word, except once in a while you hear Hashem. Hashem, she knows Hashem. Oh, Hashem, she knows Hashem. Ah, no, no, Hashem. Hashem. Yeah, Baruch, uh, you understand, we as parents, we understand what she says, but as a stranger, you come, you see this, you're like it's, we don't know what she's saying, but it's Kodesh. Bottom line is, she puts her entire self into this blessing. You must think Mashiach must be coming from the ceiling. <laughs> Why? All she knows is this one blessing. All she knows is, she doesn't know all the whole, the whole Torah, the whole Gemara, the whole Tosfod and Rashi and this. She doesn't know all that stuff. She knows one blessing, Rabotai. That's one blessing, and when she does that blessing, her entire being goes into that blessing. Alvay alenu. Alvay, we could do it. Why? We do blessings, it's like we're doing Hashem a favor. Oh, Adama, 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 Adama. 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 I got that one. You ate already? Oh, I have to bless for this? I, I, had, I meant it in the morning. I, I, it's like you're doing Hashem a favor. We're good to eat for three hours, but we don't want to do Birkat Amazon. The reality is that when we do blessings, when we do Shema, when we do all the blessings, it's like our head is somewhere here, over there, yeah. It's like a tree with branches. Stock market, baseball, football, girlfriend, boyfriend, car, shiduch, this, yeah. Everywhere, like our heads are branches. But the little babies, they don't have all that garbage. We tell them, listen, go do a blessing. They stop the world, and they're doing a blessing, and the whole world doesn't exist. It's just them, and the blessing, and Hashem. You cannot compare the two. You cannot compare that two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight year old, and anyone else in a generation. Why? Because for him, he has all this other stuff going that even if he has a lot of kavanah, he still has a lot of stuff going. For the little kid, that's all they have. That's it. It's all they have. No comparison. And that's why the Chachamim say there's no comparison. The whole world exists because of them. The whole world is saved because of them and the Mashiach will come because of them. But that's also why the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed as soon as Hashem saw that instead of them doing, doing blessings and learning blessings, they were playing in the streets, playing football. Once he saw the kids are in the street playing games, instead of being in school learning blessings, he said, there's no hope for the next generation. I must destroy it. So for all those parents that think that they're doing themselves a favor or their kids a favor by sending them to these chugim, these uh, extracurricular activities by uh, dance and, uh, and, uh, and uh, soccer and baseball and all the shtuyot, you're not doing them a favor. In reality, at the best case scenario, the best case scenario, your kid's going to be someone that is not interested in Judaism 100%. The worst case scenario, your kid's going to be a goy. Why? Let's say you're a kid, you find, okay, you send your daughter to dance. Okay, you send this five-year-old to go dance, right? Okay, you send the five-year-old to go dance. Let's say the kid's talented. He has, uh, of course, the satan's going to make her talented. 
Well, of course, you're going to make her talented. So the kid wants to continue dancing. But if she wants to be a Jew, she can't do it. Why? Because to be a successful dancer, you have to dance in front of men. Ballet is not as exclusive to women. You have to dance in front of men. So what are you going to tell her when she's 15 years old and she became an expert dancer? Oh, I'm sorry. It was just a hobby. What hobby? For you, it was a hobby. Me, I'm a career dancer now. No? So what are you going to do? Best case scenario? What's going to happen? Oh, soccer. Oh, this grat's a winner. Oh, you're going to send your kid to go play soccer. Okay, so the kid, they tell him, oh, come on, learn Gemara. Gemara, Abba, I got a game tomorrow. I got a game tomorrow. I got, I got to go practice with my friends. I go practice with my friends. Yeah, but you're not going to be a professional soccer player. You're going to tell that to your kid? You're not going to be a professional? You're going to destroy his dreams? So what's going to happen? Best case scenario, kid's talented. He ruins his entire teenage life. Becomes a guy until he's 25, 30 years old. Realizes his whole career was meaningless because he's still a short little Jewish kid. And he's not going to be a professional soccer player. But now he's also not a Jew either. So now he has to do the same difficult tshuva we had to do at 30 years old. Who? It's your parents' fault. That sent him to go play soccer. Why? Because they didn't want to learn with him. So that's the thing. Parents that think that they're doing the kids a favor by sending them to these extracurricular activities should ask themselves, what's going to happen out of this extracurricular activity? Where is it going to lead to? Okay, now it's getting the kid out of the house and off your head and you don't have a headache anymore. Fine. But what's going to be after? Who's why? Someone who sees what will be born out of this. What will happen out of this? Okay, so the kid's playing soccer. At five years old, all kids are cute. All kids are cute at five years old. Whether they're playing soccer or they're dancing or they're flipping or they're playing with mud, they're all cute at five. What about if you add a one to it? Now it's 15 with zits. What's going to happen then? What's going to happen then? Now a kid still wants to play soccer. He wants to play baseball. He wants to play basketball. But you want him to go to a yeshiva. He doesn't want to go to yeshiva. He's not interested in yeshiva. Why? The, the, the best yeshiva guy is sitting there all day. The best one is sitting there all day, going like this, all day, let's sit in the corner, the best guy. He's, for him, the best guy is the guy that's uh, getting all the girls' attention and the news' attention and runs really fast, meaning that the best guy here in the yeshiva is the epitome, it's the opposite of what he thinks is the best. You understand? So what would you do? What You kill the kid. You just destroy them. You destroy the kid. Why? He thinks that uh, he's supposed to be the next Michael Jordan. He thinks he's going to be the next uh, Messi. He's going to be the next athlete. It's his idol. His, his idol is a guy who kicks a ball. Not Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is old news. You kill the kid at five years old. So that's why Jewish parents need to understand. You're not doing your kid a favor by sending him to all these extracurricular activities. Now, it doesn't mean that they should not be active. Let let that not enter your brain that, and manipulate what I'm saying to the point where I'm telling you that the kid should be sitting down forever and never get up and all everybody become paraplegic. Okay? I'm not saying that. Kids should be active. They need to be active. They actually have to be active because they cannot sit like an adult. They cannot be a Rav Yashiv at six years old. But don't make a hobby out of it where it's every day and it's organized sport and they go and they go on, they're on a team Okay, they want to play with the friends here and there, a little bit here and there, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Every kid needs a little shtuyot in their life. Every kid needs a little fun, nonsense in their life. But don't make it organized. Only thing that should be organized is learning. Everything else unorganized. Today it's basketball, tomorrow it's, I don't know, some other ball, and this ball, and that ball. Every day it's something else. Don't ever think you're going to be a professional in this stuff. This is just for fun. It's just for fun. That's good. That's fine. That's fine. You need some activity. You need to move. You don't, you know, you don't want your kid to be 900 pounds at 8 years old. You want him to, to move a little bit. That's fine. There's no problem with that. But once you make it into a, a whole thing where they are on a traveling team and they're uh, all this stuff, you're killing the kid. You're killing the kid. It's, and by the way, I don't know about you, but how many real successful athletes are Jewish in history anyway? There's one guy that did shuva after he retired from, from sports. If he was actually on a Super Bowl team. I forget his name. 
is in a Super Bowl team, um, I think it was the Dallas Cowboys, became actually a uh, speaker. There was a story written about him in, uh, in Zman, maybe 15 years ago, something like that, 10, 15 years ago. But that's after he retired from the sport. Aside from that, in general, it's virtually impossible to be a successful athlete as a Jew, number one, because our physical ability is not like the gleam, and number two, because you cannot be a religious Jew and keep all these, uh, you know, all these sports. It's just not possible. Bill Goldberg is not a religious Jew. No, but he was a football player. He was Jewish. He was a football player. Yeah, Jewish. Safek is Jewish, but yeah. Jews are all on the teams. Huh? They're on the teams. Ken, the Jews are on the teams. Yeah, the Jews are on the teams. Yeah. yeah, Goldberg. Yeah, he's not exactly religious, but yeah. Yeah. So that's the point. So at the best case scenario, the guys are going. That's the thing. That's the best case scenario. The guy succeeds. And he's a goy. So that's 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 when you, you just you destroyed your kid spiritually. Yeah. You said you said to, you said before like there's this guy. He said he's keeping a brit, but he's cheating on his wife. How can you keep keep the brit cheating on his wife? Keeping his brit meaning he's not doing it himself, but he's he's replaced the girlfriend he has in the bathroom with an actual person. Meaning he's violating his brit in another way. Of course he's not. He's violating the brit. Of course he's also going. Because the rabbi was naive himself. He it, he right, thought he thought, he's, he, he's learning all day. No, I mean, listen, the, wi- the wives, wives are allowed to move. They're not uh, necessarily uh, bound to be inside four walls. So when she came, he started... She wasn't supposed to go inside his house. She was supposed to go to the house to pick up the money and then leave. Just like you go, you send your wife to go, uh, you know, to go pick up groceries. She goes, she picks up the groceries and comes home. You're not, we're not uh, Muslims. Right. You obviously enticed her. You slick speech. You enticed her to do other things. Everybody has a Yitzhara. Everybody has a Yitzhara. Everybody has a Yitzhara. What the details of how Yitzhara was, I don't know. All I know is that she fell for it. He fell for it. Everybody fell for it. And that called, caused the Choban. The point is, is that the Satan pays cash. Satan has a lot of money. Satan is going to convince you that your sin is a mitzvah. That's the job of the Satan. Satan is going to convince you your, 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 your sin is a mitzvah, that your Lashon Ara is mitzvah, that your pride is mitzvah, that your everything is a mitzvah. Everything is a mitzvah. That's what the Lashon Ara, that's what the Satan is going to do. He's going to convince you that everything that you're doing is mitzvah. And the reality is, is that unless you acknowledge that you have evil in you, that you have a yetzerah, you've already lost the battle. We already lost the battle. So the point is that we learn all these shiurim, after the shiur, you reflect, you start analyzing yourself, where do I stand? What's the most difficult for, thing for me to deal with? What is the one thing that I know for sure is not the will of Hashem? By the way, this was a secret of how I stopped smoking. I smoked for over 20 years, cigarettes. And uh, when I first started doing tshuva, I learned that, you know, you're not really supposed to smoke because uh, you are supposed to protect your body. But my Yetzirah told me, yes, but there is a leniency that they write that if you're already addicted to it, then you're allowed to smoke on certain holidays. So if you're allowed to smoke on certain holidays, then that probably means that you're allowed to smoke. So then when I learned a little bit more and I realized, wait, yeah, but it's still hurting your, 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 your body. You're not really supposed to smoke. But I said, yeah, but how am I studying at 3 o'clock in the morning? I'm smoking cigarettes. How am I up? It's helping me stay up. It's helping me stay awake. My Yetzirah was very creative, by the way. Genius. I'm like, oh, if I didn't smoke at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, I wouldn't be able to study. And if I'm not studying, how am I going to learn Torah? If I don't know Torah, who's going to have this? If I have to smoke, it's a mitzvah that I smoke. It's mitzvah, it's for, it's for the honor of Am Yisrael. Hashem will remove all the sins because it's for the honor of Am Yisrael. I'm doing Kiruv now. I made the smoking into a mitzvah. Smoking became a mitzvah. Why? Because it's helping me study in the middle of the night and ta da 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 da. Tachles, bottom line, the more you analyze, the more I realize I'm all full of it. Full of it. Nonsense, nonsense. It's not the will of Hashem. If it was the will of Hashem, He would create me with a cigarette in my hand. It's not the will of Hashem. So that's when it got real. 
So I said, okay, so I'm doing this whole thing. I changed my whole life. I left the business. I left this. I did this. I did this. I did this. For what? For the will of Hashem. But yet at the same time, I'm doing it with a cigarette in my hand. That's not the will of Hashem. And I said, I don't want to quit smoke. I like smoking. I don't want to quit smoking. I want to smoke. I like smoking. I enjoy it. I care less about the disease. I already have enough sickness. I'm good with disease. Good. I don't want to stop. But the problem is, it's against God. That's the problem. Source of, it's against God? Shmartim, it's in Torah. It's in the Torah, I suppose. Shmartim et nafshotechem. It's a pasuk in the Torah who says, Shmartim et nafshotechem. You're supposed to protect your body. You're not supposed to do, not supposed to do things that are going to put your, your, your health at risk. But the key is when I realized that this is not Ritzon Hashem. This is not the will of God. He did not create me in the world to smoke cigarettes. And I only realized this after students made a comment. Even though I generally wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't smoke in front of people. Because I realized there was something wrong with it. I had a uh, couple of, st- uh, one student or two students said something about it. Oh, you smoke. Wow, okay, you smoke. And I realized, oh, this is not good. And little by little, I started realizing, okay, I have to stop. I have to stop. Why? Because not the will of God. And that's what the Gemara says, Rabban Gamliel says in, says in Gemara Maseret Menachot, a person should never say that he doesn't want to eat milk and meat. Or he doesn't want to eat, it wasn't, doesn't want to wear shatnez. Because in reality, he probably likes milk and meat. In reality, he probably likes the uh, jacket that has shatnez. So you should never say he doesn't like it. Because it's not true. It's not true. What should he say? He should say, I want to eat milk and meat. I want to wear shatnez. But what can I do that my father in heaven said no? It's not that I don't want to eat pig. I want to eat pig. But my father in heaven said no. It's not that I don't want to be with this one that I'm not allowed to be with. I want. But what can I do that my Father in Heaven said no? That's the reason. That's the real reason. It's not that we all become so pure that we don't want to sin anymore. We all want to sin. But we don't sin. Why? Because it goes against our Father in Heaven. That's the key. That is the root of tshuva. That is the root of tshuva. That's how I quit smoking. That's how I quit a lot of other things. And the reality is that's how we continue doing tshuva. We realize it's not the will of Hashem it barach. It's not the will of Hashem. Once you realize that it's not the will of Hashem, already that changes the price. So Bezat Hashem, this gives us some chizuk to get prepared for the holiday, the, uh, the, the fast. We have a few more shiurim beforehand. We have another shiur on Tuesday here. Uh, and then Wednesday in August in Miami. Uh, we'll have some other, we'll have the Pekah Avot Shul, and Bezat Hashem, we'll continue. Unless you have any pressing questions, go enjoy the food. You have? Say that. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen.